Right. You know, man, we would have this it. out. <laughs> we just took some stuff. <laughs> Yeah. All right. So we're recording now, right? Okay, we're recording. Okay, everybody, are we happy? <laughs> happy, happy, happy. <laughs> that green button made you record. I guess. <laughs> so we'll just move on as if we're recording. <laughs> okay. All right. Don't we love technology, everyone? Once you learn how to do it, you'll be hating it when you're struggling. Love yeah. part about you. All right, so can you guys hear me? And can you see the screen that it says boot camp? Yes. Okay, perfect. All right, while I scroll down to where we left off, which is page 12 in your book, uh, does anyone have any questions about Tuesday? Any questions about anything that happened on Tuesday? In mm -hmm. class. I do want to hear me. Yeah. Yes. 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 Where did you guys get a book from? Who needs a book? Okay. Uh, can you shoot me your um, email in the chat and I will send you it from my phone, okay? Okay, thanks. Does anyone else need a book? If so, put your email address in the chat line. Mariana, in the meantime, do you have a question? Yes. Um, I was thinking about the um, item nine relocation uh -huh. and the PCS. I got like some thoughts. I was thinking about it, uh -huh. and uh, I quite am sure about how that works for PCS. When is it considered a relocation? Because from experience, you never had anything paid for us when you PCS and when I asked my client uh, about the home with me, if she uh -huh. was in a program, she said no. And then I talked to my husband too. I asked, is this considered a relocation? He said no. And how do I know if it's considered a relocation in this case or if okay. it's not? So what it is, is if, if they are getting a benefit because they're using a particular agent. So like USAA, mm -hmm. if they use a USAA referred agent, USA gives them somewhere between 16 and $2,000 back credits to them. So it's those situations. Okay. So okay. regular military moves, probably not, but if they're using the lender of USAA, See, that's where it comes into play. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I've got Christina, Grace, and is it Nicey or Nisi? It's Nisi. Nisi? Okay. I'm going to, it's a long email that Chris sent out up to Robert, but I'm just going to use that to get you guys this as quick as I can. And everyone, so is it G Dash Miller? Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah, if you were here in class, you would have snacks. Do you guys have snacks at home? That might be the issue. <laughs> you gotta keep your brain. Stop laughing. How many snacks have you had this morning? I haven't had any snacks. Well, she laughed. Oh. <laughs> Let's see, Grace at Gmail. Better put a lock on the refrigerator. <laughs> All right. Uh, Enter. Thank you. Okay. Don't tell anyone upstairs that there's snacks down here. <laughs> Hello, Deb. Hello. Barbara. Hey, Barbara. How are you? I'm fine. Barbara said hi. I started looking around like it was somebody back there. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> I 
It hasn't happened with us on this site, but guys, just for courtesy, uh, when we're not speaking to one another, you know, keep yourself muted. And if you do need to use the facilities, don't take your phone with you. <laughs> and if you do, if you do, mute it and put the camera up. Yeah, that was what I was saying. At least mute, no video, no audio, please. <laughs> right. Um, it's happened a time or two. Okay, so I'm sending it out. Three people asked for it. All right, so as they bring that up on their phone, anyone else have any questions? In the room here, Jim, go ahead. Number 16, in practical terms, the number one you taught on a contract never leaves anything blank. Like. <laughs> it's not applicable in the court of that. But my point is, in practical terms, what is typically written okay. in number 16? Great question. So Jim is asking on paragraph 12, and that was going to be one of my first things I talked about. Uh, paragraph 12, uh, page 12, paragraph 16, other provisions. Now, if there's an, an other provision that you want to add to the buyer's agreement, and if there's an addendum that already exists for that provision, you don't try to rewrite it here. You use the addendum, you know, for whatever it is. Um, but if there's something that's simple, like, um, let's see, from a buyer's perspective, well, it could be you might want to reiterate what from the paragraph that says residential property. Uh, maybe you want to go into more detail here. You could use a space for that. Um, or that, um, you know, it's really hard to say on the buyer side. It's less on the buyer side. You're going to have other provisions here, but if the buyer really wants something in here um, that's not already addressed in the contract, you could put it in there, but we don't want you recreating legal language. It's just for simple additions for something. It's best that it's left blank. Is that fair to say? Yeah, it's best that it's left blank unless there, and if you really need to add something and you're not sure about right, how to add it. More complicated, right, right, no. Oh. So NA is good. Right, you don't even have to put NA. And this, no, because um, it's when you sign it, you both sign it as a blank, okay? All right, so if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and go to page 12. And we just talked about paragraph 16, which was gonna, I was gonna talk about that. If there is anything else that could replace that, and again, on the buyer's agreement, it's not so much as uh, the listing that you might come up with something or the contract. So right below that though, in bold letters, it says buyer should consult with buyer agent before visiting any resale or new homes or contacting any other real estate agent representing sellers to avoid the possibility of confusion over the brokerage relationship and misunderstandings about liability and compensation. So you really want to make sure your client understands that, that when they see someone on Zillow and it says, deal directly with the owner or they see a for sale by owner, you, you, you need to make sure your client understands that they are not the one to contact those entities. Or if they go to a new homes site, let's say they're just out driving around one Saturday or Sunday afternoon as a family and they see a new home site being built there and there's a office. Oh, let's go stop and see what they have, okay? So what you wanna do is you wanna train your clients to know that you are always on their mind. And Drew Swarski, when he would teach the um, buyer presentation class, he would give his clients a little Ziploc bag with his business cards in there. And he would tell them, this is your get out of jail free card. Basically, by presenting this to other agents, they're not gonna call you and put you on their call list, okay? So, that's a good thing to do is when you meet with your clients, you should give them several of your business cards. And certainly if new homes construction is a possibility for them, you definitely wanna make sure they understand that when they go meet with new home construction, and like I said, it may not have been their intent that day while they were out taking a drive, but it often happens that they walk into new home construction. So I had clients who bought here in Fredericksburg and they walked in and the first thing they said was, we are already working with a realtor, here's her card. We were not planning on being down here today, but friends live in the area and they want us to come 
and see what you guys are doing in their section because we're retiring and we might want to move down here. And that's how that started. So they already made the connection with the new homes people that put me in touch with them. Okay. And then when they had their big meeting, I was here. I was here for the whole contract signing. I was here for the walkthroughs. I was here for the um, visits to the design center. You know, if my client wanted me to go, the first two they did, the third they said it wasn't necessary. But, you know, I'm being paid to work. So just because it's new construction doesn't mean I don't have everything I need to do. Okay. So with that said, um, most of you hopefully received the document I emailed out this morning. I wanted some clarification, but it's the one that's got the, the, um, the three brokerages information in it. Do you want this hard copy? Did you get it this morning? Mm -hmm. it. So anyway, so when you flip your page over, the buyer is going to sign and then the broker. So it depends on which office you're in. Then for Fredericksburg and Falls Church, the supervising broker is Shannon and her contact information is there. So you would pull her name in and her email address as she's listed at the two different, you know, where they're listed. Um, so on the document itself for Fredericksburg, you don't put Shannon's email, you put Keller Williams 478 at Yahoo. And in Falls Church, it's KW Falls Church at Gmail. Shannon's gonna sign from those portals, okay? I'm sorry, I take that back. Um, let me think through this for a second. Okay, yeah, that changed. So in the first, on the front page of the document is where you're gonna put the Keller Williams Realty 478 at Yahoo and the um, Keller Williams Falls Church at Gmail. That's on the first page of the agreement. And then in your DocuSign for Shannon's signature, you're going to use her email that's listed here, okay? And then for Kingstown, you're going to use Angela's email, okay? And on the front page, you're gonna use Kingstown Realty Group at gmail.com. Is that clear as mud for everybody? Okay, then below the line, if you guys see below the line on page 13, that's where you are actually memorialized. Because remember, you're not really part of this contract, except for the fact that you're the designated agent. So below the line is where your contact information goes. And then this is where you would put Shannon's name, her email, and her cell phone or phone number that's listed on the sheet that I sent you this morning. So that's how she's reached, should you not be available. And the reason we have to do this, and it's important that you do this, some agents have the habit of not connecting their broker and with their client, thinking, you know, they don't need to worry about the broker. After the broker signs it, they're not really involved. But in this day and age, in any day and age, anything can happen at any time. You can get really sick. I mean, COVID's on everyone's mind, but a simple car accident. Yeah. You could be driving to a closing and you're in a car accident and your cell phone has died. You're alive, but your cell phone's dead. And so they're sitting at the table looking for you and you're not there. So the first thing that your client should know is to call your broker, to call the office, because the office can then help answer any questions that may come up because you've loaded everything into command. Every document you have, you've put into command, therefore, the, the staff can go into command and look at any documents should a question arise. So what about if the, the buyer says, well, the seller gave me a credit. The seller goes, I don't remember signing me the credit letter. And let's say someone forgot to send it to the title company and you're not at the table. Well, if you loaded everything into command, the staff, the supervising broker, the principal broker should be able to go into command and find those documents and get them to the title company, okay? It's very important. Did we discuss this hyphen thing? I'm, I'm looking at the, at, the, at the thing, the email thing. Yeah, on I- On that page, if 
Well, that's a great, uh, the first thing he says, Fredericksburg, page one, brokerage info. And it says, Keller Williams Realty, hyphen, Fredericksburg. Yeah, I, I need to talk to Summer just okay, to clarify so that. Yeah. Well, okay. Yeah. So okay. Yeah. Um, He's talking about the hyphen in Fredericksburg. I just need to verify that. One more time. Hyphenated. On page 13, under buyer's agent contact information, that's me. Yeah, under buyer's agent contact information, that's you, the agent. So, right. it's, so I'm Jim Adler, buyer's agent. What's my team name if applicable? Well, if you have a team, thank you, Jim. So under your buyer's agent, if you have a team, like for example, myself, I'm Debbie Roof, Deborah Roof, Deb Roof. And my team name is Debbie and Daphne, your home team, LLC. So because I'm on a team, I have to put it there. I have to put my LLC information there. Okay. So put Keller Williams 478? No, no, no. Now, because we're called team leaders, like Summer's a team leader, right. Sheila's a team leader, Chris is a team leader. When you get to contracts and stuff, when it says team leader, no, that is not your Keller Williams team leader. Remember, these documents are broad for all real estate companies. Okay. It's just coincidence that we have teams and team leaders at KW. So what does team leader mean specifically on this document? If it's a team so if it's a team leader, then that means the leader of a team. So in my case with Daphne, when we do an LLC, the state requires that someone is the leader of the team. So in our case, I'm the team leader, so I put our LLC, and then I put my name as the team leader. So when you're on a team, you could be a buyer's agent, a listing agent for a big, large group, then if they can't reach you as the agent, they want to know who your team leader is, they would go for you, the team leader. Again, because Keller Williams uses the word team leader for our supervising that doesn't mean staff. That that's what Correct. On this Correct. Correct. Okay. Okay. And Jim's so, new to the <laughs> real estate. And as a supervising broker, you're telling me to use Shannon. Shannon's information. Shannon Lowerstein. Mm -hmm. On your form, right? Correct. Thank you. Correct. Okay. For Fredericksburg Falls Church. Okay. And Angela is in Kingstown. Okay? Good. Can you repeat okay. Aaron's information for me? I'm sorry. Whose information? Aaron. Shannon? Shannon. Shannon. Sorry. I did, uh, you did not get my email this morning, did you? Okay, let me forward, um, all right, let me forward, you get the three of you that I just forwarded the PDF to, let me forward the document we're talking about as well. Okay. This comes up, you go meet it. All right, so. Um, What will happen is you'll do all your documents and then you'll get an email from Shannon saying, your stuff is complete. You're not in the blind. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's why I have a meeting. Uh, great. It's a lot of passions. Yeah, I'm looking at that. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the positive. <laughs> oh, it's a good thing. It's a, it's a right of passage. It's a good thing because now your, your paperwork got to be right. Um, oh, no, no question. Deb spoke on it. Okay, the three of you who got the PDF should be getting, and the reason I sent it to everyone this morning and the three of you now, and a Word document is so that you can use it to cut and paste from, okay? Um, so you'll get that contact information, all right? So now, if you go back to page, to your table of contents, page two, and you'll see that your buyer's package, we've gone through one document of the buyer's package, which is the exclusive right to represent buyer's agreement. And we still have five documents to go through. So we're gonna start on those now. My marriage license is this much information. All right, so just wanted to write. So. You know the rules. Okay, so. This is a change to this document for those who have used it before. Most agents, the state of Virginia provides these to us. They strongly suggest we do them. Our three brokerages require that we use them. Okay, so 
It used to be understanding your rights and responsibilities. Now it's understanding your rights under the Virginia Condominium Act, Condominium Act and Properties Owner Association Act. So let me stop for a second and talk about the word Property Owners Association Act. That's the name of the act. And if you use the acronym for it, POA, then many of us think power of attorney. So when we talk about the Property Owners Association Act, we refer to it as an HOA. They are the same. An HOA is a Property Owners Association. But we speak of it as an HOA. That's what it's in our bright as HOA. But the legal term and the legal name of the act is the Property Owners Association Act. So, for, so we don't confuse people. We say HOA instead of POA. Okay. So now, Condominium Act Resale Disclosure. So the Virginia Condominium Act as amended, I'm not going to read all the code. I'm going to skip over that, okay? As amended requires the owner selling a lot located within a development that is subject to the Condominium Act to obtain from the Unit Owners Association a resale certificate in conformity with the provisions and provide it to the buyer. So the resale certificate should contain an appropriate statement pursuant to the subsection H which needs to be notarized and if applicable, an appropriate statement pursuant, okay? So now this is gonna make sense to us right now, okay? <laughs> a statement of any expenditure of funds approved by the unit owners association or the executive board that requires an assessment in addition to the regular assessment during the current or in immediately succeeding fiscal year. So that one is, let's say there's a huge snowfall and um, they had to spend more money than is in the budget for snow removal, then they have to assess. So let's say there's 100 units, they spent $300 more that year for snow removal, each unit then owes $3. That's a special assessment. It's never going to be that low. <laughs> yeah. But just my own math sake today. Okay. And then when there is a special assessment, there's an amount associated per unit, and there's a deadline of when it's paid off. So as agents, when you are listing a property, you have to ask your client, are they in an HOA? Are they in a condo? You should know that already before you meet with them. And then you need to ask them, are there any special assessments? Okay. And then you check with the board to make sure, because you have to list that in MLS that there's a special assessment, because you might say that the condo fees are $400, but there could be a special assessment of $400 a month for the next six months because the roof fell in or the AC broke or they're putting in a new tennis court, you know, so um, you have to disclose all that. Okay. A statement including the amount of all assessments and any other fees or charges currently imposed by the Unit Owners Association together with any known post-closing fee charged by the common interest community manager, if any, and associated with the purchase disposition maintenance of the condominium unit and the use of the condominium elements and the status of the account. So they have to give a full accounting. You have, the buyer needs to know that there are assessments. So when you move in, it's gonna say, greetings to you, new buyer. To be part of our community, we're gonna ask you to pay us X amount of dollars, okay? And that might be outside of move-in fees, outside of elevator fees, outside of mailbox keys, outside of parking fees, outside of pool fees, okay? They just might have a fee that, that they use to collect so they can process you and put you into the system. But in reality, if I'm showing, this is part of a buyer's agreement, I get that. In reality, now if I take the next step and I'm showing them a property that is in fact a condominium, I can request the condominium package, correct? So the condominium packages are delivered after <laughs> ratification and with 14 Please days you. after ratification. Right. That information should be included in that. It should be in the listing online. 
or to do work. Right. So any fees that are included in a condominium or an HOA that a buyer has to pay, special assessments, moving fees, anything, that is listed in the multiple listing system. <coughs> okay. okay. All right. And it should be in the contract as well. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. No. Okay. A statement of whether there is any other entity or facility to which the unit owner may be liable for fees or other charges. Okay. So, for example, when you're in a planned uh, neighborhood, develop, urban development neighborhood, a PUD, um, like Reston, Virginia, for example, I can speak to Reston because I lived in Reston a decade or more ago and um, I bought a foreclosure. I knew there was a fee to pay for the HOA, but no one during the whole time of that deal told me about the Reston Association. So because I lived in Reston and there's a few exempt places within Reston, but the majority of the people in Reston, they pay a cluster fee, whether they live in a single family, a townhouse or a condominium, and they pay a Reston Association fee once a year right after Christmas and it's due at the end of January. And they don't let you pay partial payments. So I moved in in June and right after Christmas, I got my statement wanting $450 in 30 days. So it was not a nice Christmas present. And um, so you've got to make sure your clients know that. So when they're in the planned community development, they may have more than one fee. So if it's a condominium, for example, you might see on MLS, it'll say condo fee and an HOA fee. That means there are two separate things. There could be two separate packages that they will receive as well, okay? So the current reserve study report or summary of each report and a statement of the status and amount of any reserve or replacement fund and any portion of the fund designed for any specified project by the executive board. So this is a simple report, okay? A copy of the unit owner's current budget or summary of such budget prepared by the unit owner's association and copy of the statement of his financial position, a balance sheet for the last fiscal year for which a statement is available, including the statement of the balances of any outstanding loans that the unit association. So one of the reasons they have to do that is you are you're, you, the, not you, the agent, but the buyer needs to know, am I going to move into a place that is upside down or owes debts? Am I going to have the parking lot fixed if, we're, if we don't have any money in our budget? It's not you, the agent's responsibility to share that with your client. It's your client's responsibility to look at these documents and decide to move forward or to uh, void the deal, okay? A statement of nature and the status of pending actions or unpaid judgments to which the unit owners association is a party that either could or would have material impact on the unit association. The unit covers or relates to being the unit being purchased. So that's if um, let's say someone walked into a condo and fell and broke their hip. Okay and they decide they're gonna sue the condo because they think there's deep pockets. So you own your unit, but you're also a part of a condominium association and depending on how their insurance is set up, some of those fees could be passed down to you, okay? So you need to be aware of there's any lawsuits or worse yet, when I was a paralegal in California, we were involved in one of these where the, um, the home of the condo owners were suing the association and the builder and everybody else because of poor construction to include the county inspector who did not inspect properly, who took paybacks. So the place is falling apart around their ears because of poor construction. Okay. So that's where lawsuits then it makes it very difficult to sell the property and most lenders won't lend to it depending on what it is. So the lenders are going to get a report as well. They're going to request a questionnaire and they may or may not lend based on that. Okay. A statement of the nature and status of, I already said that. Okay. Uh, uh, eight, a statement setting forth the insurance coverage is provided for all unit owners by the unit owners association, including the fidelity bond maintained by the unit owners association with additional insurance coverage would normally be secured for each individual unit owner. 
So you as an individual owner have your insurance and it often is more like renter's insurance in a way. You own inside and depend on the condo and the way that's written, you might own the walls or the ceiling or whatever. So you gotta make sure that your insurance dovetails with their insurance and that you're fully covered for anything that goes wrong in the unit. Uh, a statement that any improvements or alterations made to the unit or the limited common elements assigned there to or are not in violation of the condominium instruments. A copy of the current bylaws, rules, and regulations and architectural guidelines adopted by the Unit Owners Association and the amendments to any of such documents. So one of the rules could be that when you go to sell your property, you're not allowed to put a sign in the window. And you could be in a condo association, but it's actually a, it's actually a townhouse with a little yard out front. But they may prohibit you in their design and architectural stuff to put a sign in the yard. And if you're in a condo unit, whether it's a, a garden or a high rise, most of them prohibit you from putting a sign in the window as well. Okay, they will fine you heavily for doing that. Um, so that's what you want to be aware of. So as an agent on the listing side, when you're taking a listing and it's a townhouse that's run by a condo, make sure you find out what the rules are. I've sold a property in a um, 55 plus community in Haymarket and they wanted you to purchase their little signs that were architecturally the same to put in the yard. They did not like you having your own signs. They limited you with, to what signs you could put in the yard, okay? They also limited when you could put signs up for open houses. There again, things you need to know, okay? A copy of the notice given to the unit owners by the Unit Owners Association of any current or pending rule or architectural violations. So someone may have painted their balcony pink. It's not allowed, okay? So they're going to be given a violation and it's going to be noted in the minutes. A copy of approved minutes of an executive board of unit owners association meetings for the six calendar months preceding the request for the resale certificate. So every board's a little bit different as to when they meet at what time of the month and when the notes are taken and then they're voted on and put in the minutes the month later. So I had a situation where I was selling a listing in Reston. It was not part of the RA association, but they had the condo association. And unbeknownst to us, the person buying the unit as an investor was on that condo association's board. So when we presented her with the documents, she came back to us right away and said, I can't accept these. You don't have current documents. Because we'd order them like, you know, three weeks before. And um, what well, turned out when I called the condo association unit, told them what was going on, they said, well, we had the meeting January 7th, we don't have our next one to February, so those won't even be voted in on. And when I mentioned the person's name, they, they said, well, she knows that, she's on the board. She was trying to delay closing for another 14 days, and she was using the condo saying that we didn't have updated documents and we had to get our 14 days, business days to do that. Well, it didn't work. She was the seller? She was the buyer. Sorry, but... She was the buyer. She was the buyer trying to say, she was the buyer trying to say that we had not given her current no, documents. She's the buyer trying to purposely delay the close. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Why? She, I don't know. I don't know why she wanted to delay the close. But she was fighting us saying that um, we did not have current documents. So we had to get a letter from, even though she was on that board, we had to get an official letter from that board stating that they were the only current documents that they had at that time. Okay. I told you I have weird situations to help me teach this. <laughs> Certification that the Unit Owners Association has filed the Common Interest Community Board, the annual report required, the filing number signed, the CICB, and the expiration date of such filings. So you're, the condominium boards have to file documents, okay, 
And if they don't file certain documents to certain entities at the right time, then your lenders will not lend to them. They go to a HUD site, they go research, <laughs> and if the documents have not been filed and the certificate has expired, a lender cannot lend to that unit. Now, sometimes it's a simple oversight that there's nothing wrong with the unit's paperwork. Maybe it's this change of staff and someone didn't know they needed to file it by an expiration date, or just like the realtors, you wait to the last minute and they didn't get their paperwork in on time, so it shows an expiration date. So a lender will work around with them if the paperwork gets in, okay? Okay, a statement of any limitation on the number of persons who may occupy a unit as a dwelling. So the occupancy of a unit depends on the square footage, okay? That's has a lot to do with it. Yeah, I can't sell a one bedroom and have 20 people living there. <laughs> That's correct. You cannot sell a one bedroom and have 20 people That's living not. there. <laughs> a statement setting forth any restrictions, limitations, or prohibitions on the right of the unit owner to display the flag of the United States, including reasonable restrictions to the size, time, place, and manner of placement of display of such flags. Okay. A statement setting forth any restriction, limitation, or prohibition to the right of a unit owner to install or use solar energy collection devices on the unit owner's property. Okay, so you can't necessarily change out your windows to make them solar. <laughs> okay, a statement in indicating any known project approvals currently in effect issued by secondary mortgage market agencies and a copy of a fully completed form developed by the CICB, okay? So that's about condos. Now, I believe in one of my classes, um, one of the guys from Kingstown, Bill, told me that, I think it was Bill or Gary, said that there is a um, area in Alexandria somewhere that are detached homes, but they're run like a condo. So I don't remember where that was, but I know that condos can look like apartments and they can also look like townhouses but it's the way the ownership has taken place and how it's put together. So whether it's a condo package or an HOA, Don't okay? Assume. Don't assume. Look at the tax record. Okay, so Property Owners Association Disclosure Package or HOA. The Property Owners Association Act of the Code of Virginia as amended requires a seller selling a lot located within a development that is subject to a POA Act to obtain for the Unit Owners Association a disclosure package in conformity with the provisions, disclosure package, and provide it to the buyer. Disclosure package should contain the name of the association and in, if incorporated, the state in which the association is incorporated and the name and address of a registered agent in Virginia. So corporations can be in other states, okay? A lot of states used to use Delaware because of the tax structures and stuff like that. But whenever you're incorporated outside of the state of Virginia, there has to be a registered agent within the state of Virginia that you can contact. And that's why it's like that. You must maintain a physical address here, correct? There has to be a registered agent with a physical address in Virginia, in right? So there's companies that's, that hire themselves out as registered agents, okay? A statement of expenditure of funds approved by the association or the board of directors that shall require any assessment in addition to the regular assessment during the current year or the immediately succeeding fiscal year, okay? So any extra funds, you know, like I said, snow removal, repairs, et cetera. A statement including the amount of all assessments and any other mandatory fees or charges currently imposed by the association together with any post-closing fee charged by the common interest community manager, if any, and associated with the purchase, disposition, and maintenance of the lot and the right of use of the common areas and the status of the account. Okay. So that circumvents me using a company to make me a registered agent. No, they for you. Oh, yeah, you don't have to have a registered agent if you live in Virginia yourself unless you choose to. No, I'm saying if I was out of state, 
was trying to use one of those companies that might be able to fix that. No, no, it allows you to use a registered agent. Oh, I can use a registered mm -hmm. agent? Yeah. No, this provision allows anyone to have, you just, if you, if you own a business inside Virginia and you live outside of Virginia, you have to have a registered agent in Virginia. And okay. yeah, I think LegalZoom does that for people and, and some others. Um, okay. <laughs> Could I use this document? <laughs> no. I'm in the land. Could I be using this document to say, see, either you want to study and become a real estate agent, or you just want to buy a property. And if you want to buy a property, sign here and let me That's right. that through all of this. Otherwise, you can, we can go over every section, dot, dash, or whatever. Right. But either you're trying to be a buyer or you're trying to break into real estate. Right. I can help you with this. I can help you with this. <laughs> so, no, 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 but okay, I'm guys, that's not, okay. But let's not do well. So, because of everybody else online, you got to operate the way. Right. So, in, in in kind of tagging off of what Jim is saying and Derek here, I do not read this document to my clients. I give it to them. It's for their benefit to read. Okay. That's why you know Virginia doesn't require, it, but our brokerages do because it's informative. So when your buyer, your seller says, "I didn't know that," when we provided this to them. I say, here's an explanation. Now, this one's new. Here's an explanation of what a condo, what your condo doc should have, what your HOA doc should have, anything that's in here. This is what this is for. I suggest that you peruse it, okay? But we're required to have to give it to them. We're required, we're required to, to give it to them. We right. are not required to review it with them. We're not required we're not, to read it with them. We're encouraging us not to. Correct. No, you need to go through the actual buyer's agreement with them. You don't have to read it to them, but you need to understand it yourself. Is why I teach this class. Right. Is that you can have it set on the table upside down, whether you've got your computer up or not, and you can go through paragraph by paragraph. You need to know what it says. They ask you a question. You right. And you can say, well, let's back up a minute. Let's just read what it says. Okay. It's okay to say that. Let's just read what the law says. When someone asks you a question about a particular paragraph, don't just go off the top of your head. Mm -hmm. Read it. Okay. That's what I'm doing with you guys to, for, to, for you guys to hear it, at least hear it once. At least have I had it read to you, whether you read it or not. Okay. Have the yeah. The okay. Are stiff. They start out okay. A statement of whatever there is any other entity or facility to which the lot owner may be liable for fees or charges. The current reserve report. And the summary thereof, a statement of the status and the amount of the reserve or replacement fund and any portion of the fund allocated to the board of directors for the specified project. A copy of the association's current budget or summary thereof prepared by the association and a copy of its statement of income and expenses or statement of the financial position balance sheet for the last fiscal year for which such statement is available including a statement of the balance due of any outstanding loans on the association. So think about right now with COVID, okay? People have lost their jobs. People are not making mortgage payments. People are not making condo and HOA payments either. So those are debts on the HOA and the condo. They have to carry those, those debts are there. So they're hurting too, but they have to report those debts. So if you're looking at a balance sheet right now, there could be a lot of uncollected debts for people sitting in condos and HOAs who are not paying their bills, okay? So, you know, again, a lender's gonna look at that and say, we can't loan there because of this, okay? That's why you want reserve funds to, for, for emergencies and things like that, okay? A statement of the nature and status of any pending lawsuit unpaid judgment to which the association is a party to either could or would have material impact on the association or its members or that relates to a lot being purchased. Okay. A statement setting forth what insurance coverage is provided for all lot owners by the association, including the fidelity bond maintained by the association and what additional insurance would be normally be secured by an individual lot owner. So when it's a HOA, your insurance coverage covers the outside and the inside of, and the property, and depending on what type of property and how much insurance you have and what type of insurance, you know, as to what it covers. 
most people, you know, your insurance, for example, your plumbing stops at your foundation wall unless you pay a rider for that, okay? Um, that's from personal experience. <laughs> a statement that any improvement or alteration made to the lot or uses, or uses made a lot or common area assigned thereto are or are not in a violation of the Declaration of Bylaws, Rules and Regulations, Architectural Guidelines, Articles of Incorporation, if any, of the association, okay? So when you're a listing agent and you're selling a property and your clients order the documents before you as a listing agent send those documents on to the buyer's agent, you need to look at the violations and you need to tell your client to start working on them now because they're obligated to fix the violations, okay? Then go ahead and send the package on to the other side, letting them know that the violations will be worked on and that you will provide them with an updated certification clearing all those violations, okay? And you need to stay on top of your sellers to make sure it gets done, okay? Just do it, don't argue about it. A statement setting forth any restrictions, limitations, or prohibitions on the right of a lot owner to place a sign on the owner's lot advertising the lot for sale. Again, just like in Heritage Hunt, what size, what type of sign, they're going to control it. So if your client knows that there's, you know, ask, I don't see normal realtor signs in here, what's the process I go to? You yourself, before you ask your seller, can also call the association and ask them for the rules. Most likely it's on their website. You just need to read it. Okay? So do a little investigating yourself. Set yourself up as the professional. Okay? A statement setting forth any restrictions, limitations, or prohibitions on the right of the lot owner to display any flag on the owner's lot, including but not limited to reasonable restrictions as to the size, place, manner, and placement or display of any such flag and the installation of any flagpole or similar restriction necessary to display the flag. So unlike the condo, I don't know if anyone else noticed it. The condo said United States flag. This one says any flag, okay? So if you're a proud Marine or whatever and you want to display your Marine flag, you may or may not be able to. So you have to check with your association. A statement setting forth any restrictions as to the size, place, and duration of any manner of placement or display of political signs by a lot owner on his or her lot in accordance with the code. A statement setting forth any restrictions, limitations, or pro prohibition speak prohibitions on the right of the union owner to, <laughs> to install or use any solar energy collection device. Okay. So just because you own the home, if you live in a HOA, you don't have the right to do what you want to do to the property. Okay. And that's a hard thing if someone's never lived in HOA. I know my dad could never live in an HOA. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I, I have and I don't know that I want to again. But anyway, um, you know, there are certain things you just cannot do, even though you own the property, okay? Um, so they have to give a copy of the bylaws, a copy of approved minutes, a copy of any notices given to the lot owner by the association for any current or pending rule or architectural violations, okay? Now, in some HOAs and in more HOAs than condos, perhaps, but sometimes there could be color restrictions. For example, that one townhouse cannot be the same color as the two neighbors and the one across the street, okay? Uh, and maybe your... Um, gutters have to match certain things on the house so if you have something that's outside the bounds of their architectural design sometimes they say with your neighbor's approval they'll let it go so if the neighbor to the right to the left and across the street or behind you let's say your deck color is a little off than what they expected it to be maybe the person mixing the stain didn't do it right 
then you may have to get, instead of having to repay it or restain it, sometimes they'll give you an option to do an application to change that up. <laughs> Just for those of you who've never worked with HOAs, to know that that could be an option, even for yourselves, okay? Sometimes if you want to put a deck on, you're required to do that as well, okay? Certification that the association is filed with the CICB, the inner report required, with which cert certificate shall indicate the filing number assigned to the CICB and the expiration date of such filing, a statement indicating any known project approvals currently in effect issued by the secondary mortgage agencies. Um, one thing you might find in townhome situations when they talk about the um, design and the changing is your client may discover that their fence line is eight feet shy of what they actually own because it's turned into common use property or whatever. Um, and in some HOAs, the fence was just put up arbitrarily where it was. It wasn't, they didn't look at plats. So if someone wants to change their fencing at all, they would want to go through and double check uh, with their association, okay? So with that said, let's take a seven minute break, come back at one o'clock, okay? You drink coffee. Huh? You drink coffee. I don't drink coffee the other day. I usually have one in the morning, and that's about it. You know what I was saying to you, I'm sharing with you, I'm from the South Bronx, and I'm staying here. If you ever watch, you ever watch Star Trek? Morgan Fell Avenue. You ever watch Star Trek? We would be clean up. We got this straight up razor way. I was married to a Virginia. She said, when you get home, you change. I said, I know where we are. I can park anywhere, any borough in two seconds. And I ain't waiting for nobody. And she'd be like, what happened to the courtesy? That's not how I worked in. <laughs> yeah, I worked in Hunts Point in Bayonne most of my life. But we have to follow the procedures because you're going to get in trouble. Oh, I'm not saying we're not listening. I'm saying I'm no, I'm glad you get in the finance department of a car dealership for many years. If your paperwork isn't exactly what the bank wants, yeah, you, you don't go through. You are not going to get an ACH number say your boss's money is in your account. <laughs> I don't care what smooth talking you think you're going to pull. It ain't going to happen. Because everybody's playing C money. Yeah. And that funder, I've been to the, I went so far as to go to some of my lenders to visit the funding department because I learned a lesson very early. You're going to train those funders. One of two things is going to happen. And in my case, I was proud to say I had more than one bank rep come to me and say, you know, there's currently a battle going on. You find it in the funding department. That's your bank work. So what do you mean? What kind of battle? It's one of my bank work. He said, nothing. That's the problem. There's two girls in there that are fighting over the right to have, have they want to be your exclusive funder. One of them went so far as to say, Jim Adler's paperwork is like a day at the beach. It, it is so angrily packaged. Yes, because, and not being a nice guy, they, I had more than one banker tell me that 75%, 75% of the packages that bank got received on an order loan were incomplete. So my point is, if you said stuff, if you want to just see your documentation, it's sloppy, it was like this. Because they're human too. They get paid on you. They want to work on the easy stuff. They don't want to work on the easy stuff. But, but, but in practicality, and I'm simply saying, I mean, look how, look how human beings like to come to this life. <laughs> Welcome to that club. I mean, look, it's the year 2020 of our Lord, and we're still, still having a discussion because God decided to give you a better tan than he gave me. I'm sorry. Right, right, right. We, if we either going to grow up or we're going to blow up, I mean, can't yeah. people see that? Yeah, we're going to have to. Can we see that? And we got a great example of stop COVID-19. They didn't care where you live. 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 That language is fine. No, but what I mean, I mean, this I got you. But I'm saying we got a great... Example, COVID ain't here nothing. <laughs> it ain't stopping the airport. It ain't stopping nowhere. And it's no, still it's stopping us. Hey, hey, Jim. Yeah? 
the warning is watch out for the neighborhood Nazis. Neighborhood Nazis. There's a great commercial right now. Oh, the HOA. Oh, yeah. The HOA. The mailbox. Right? Right. It's too high. It's just got it. Listen, I live in an HOA. Right. Okay. It's too high. 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 We had to go and negotiate because in my backyard, my wife wants a big umbrella. So she don't go to a crisp and we can party with our friends in there. And we had to get impressed by what, like, listen, you want to get impressed? I want to invite you up. <laughs> so I got everybody. I swear, this is a true story. I'm not pulling with i been my wife for 40 years. If she wants a big tent in the backyard, guess what? She's getting a big tent in the right. backyard. Now you get approval. And you put gas. Gas have to get approval. He said, follow the rules. Right. I'm going to make sure the rules are followed, but I'm going to make sure that I get what I want at the same time. If it's righteous. I'm going to right. try to do something that's <laughs> Okay, that's crazy. But yes, but the color of the trim, forget the, forget the house. God forbid, you have a piece oh. of wood. What about the that's, roof? The <laughs> my friend had trouble the getting roof. her roof replaced. Because Man, they awesome. had to use the same material that the house was built with. Well, the build, house was built 30 years ago. That material does not exist today. Right. So she had to go back to that. They took them three months to get the HOA to approve them just to go and get something different. That's crazy. Like, that is crazy. Thank God, I just had my roof. They just put a new roof on. And yes, they blessed it before. Because otherwise, you're going to have to deliver a whole bunch of stuff, singles and stuff. And you, have, you can't put it on a house. Right. Well, my wife made sure the came deck because they're not that far away. Come, you gotta check this out before you go to these. What's up there? Needless to say, I do not live in an HOA. Uh, needless to say, you're smarter than the average bear. To, I've, I, we joke about my neighborhood because I've been a yeah. largely large, we have an acre plus lot in Pittsburgh County. And, um, um, and so there's a lot, and there's lots of trees and everything. So a lot of, I said, two kinds of people move out here. Those who don't want to disturb, uh, um, those who don't want to be disturbed by so many people, their neighbors, and those who don't want to disturb as many. And you just have to learn to tolerate the latter. Tolerate, but yes, yeah. <laughs> because you don't have an HOA, so you can't use the HOA to enforce anything on them. Say, say that again? Those who don't want to, I have a neighbor who, who used to run four-wheelers around all the time. And um, with no HOA, there was no, there was no hammer on that. We used to say, that, right. yeah, they moved there so they didn't disturb as many people. <laughs> it says two different kinds of people live in the neighborhood. Those who and want to get away from true. others and those who don't want to disturb as many. Yeah. <sighs> Alana, how old's your baby? This is Barbara. She's five months. Five months? Yeah. I've had five kids in this house. <laughs> oh, that's what we have, yeah. Yeah. My oldest is 32. Her youngest is a, is 10. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, our oldest is 9. And they're both, I don't know. Doubling over with a bad headache in the And then they all, and they all live with me. <laughs> okay, everyone. Back to work. Back to work. I gave us an extra minute or two. <laughs> I'm so generous. All right. So one of the reasons I'm reading this to you guys, it's not like I enjoy it, um, <laughs> because some people have never lived in a condo or an HOA. So as agents, you really want to understand what goes on. So though you're not the authority on the HOA for your client, but when they do say stuff like, but I own this house, you just have to remind them that they, you know, they bought into a place that has rules and regulations, or they're going to. And um, 
and they have to accept that going in. And like Jim was just saying, if you know the rules and you work around it, he wanted to put a big umbrella, he followed the rules, got all the signatures and was able to do what he wanted to do in the backyard. Uh, I saw the place and I was actually to a KW agent. Um, I was a homeowner in Reston and he was buying it for an investment. And when we bought the place, they told us what colors and there was no gutter. So we put a gutter up and we put a drain system in. And so the person inspecting it, as we say, the, the Nazi-like person said that, um, excuse me, let's turn my phone off. Um, she, um, she came through and said that the, the gutter, the downspout and the uh, diverter all had to match the color that they were touching. So basically I said to the agent who was buying the investment, I said, if you want us to paint the gutter, uh, the, you know, the gray to match the, the fascia board, the beige to match the, the stucco, the brown to match the fence, we'll be glad to do that. Or you can sign this piece of paper. And he did. He just signed the piece of paper and accepted the way it was and took on the liability himself. So, um, but I, you know, he had to accept that violation, okay? So the buyer's right of cancellation. The information contained in the resale disclosure, disclosure packet shall be current as of the date specified therein. So like in my case, the date was the date that their last meetings had been approved. Buyer may request an update of such resale certi certificate disclosure package or financial update, however, the request or receipt of an updated resale disclosure package will, be, will not extend the buyer's right of cancellation provided under the Condominium Act and POA Act. Buyer's right of cancellation begins upon the seller delivering to buyer of a resale certificate. I cannot talk today. I'm so sorry. Retail certificate, including a resale certificate disclosure package that is not in conformity with the provisions of the Condominium Act, or seller delivering to the buyer of notice that the resale certificate will not be available. The parties may extend buyer's right of cancellation to the extent permitted by the Condominium Act by ratifying the extension of review period for condominium resale certificate, property owners association disclosure package, addendum or other comparable addendums, any rights of the buyer to cancel the contract or waive conclusively if not exercised within the right of the cancellation period or prior to the settlement. The failure to receive resale disclosure, the certificate disclosure package shall not excuse any failure to comply with the provisions of the declaration articles of incorporation bylaws or rules and regulations. So that last one was like, someone can't raise their hands. Well, I didn't know because I didn't receive the package, okay? And you really can't wave your whites away from that. But same, <laughs> just as a sidebar note, when you or you have clients who are investing in property to rent out, and it's in the lease too, don't let your landlords and your clients get sloppy and not provide their tenants with the package. They need to be given the rules and regulations. The tenant doesn't necessarily need to have the budget and all that stuff, but they need to know what the bylaws say, what they have a right to do or not to do, okay? And it should be at the owner's expense to do that. They just need to copy, you know, what they have. So resale certificate disclosure package shall be deemed not, shall be deemed not to be available if A current report has not been filed by the Unit Property Owners Association with either the State Corporation Commission or the CICB as required by applicable law. Seller has made a written request to the Property Owners Association that resale certification disclosure package is provided and no such certification package has been received within 14 days or written notice has been provided by the unit property owners association that resale disclosure is not available so if your seller makes a request for it 
in, in 14 days, they haven't gotten it, um, I would ask again and try to get a letter stating why it's not available, okay? Buyer may cancel the contract without penalty. Within three days or up to seven days of extended by a ratified real estate contract after the date of the contract, if on or before the date that buyer signs the contract, buyer receives the resale certificate disclosure package, is notified that the resale certificate disclosure package will not be available or receives resale disclosure packet not in conformity with the provisions of the Condominium Act, okay? Or, 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 it's an or proposition, not an and, within three days or up to seven days, if extended by the ratified real estate contract after receiving resale disclosure package, knows that the resale certificate disclosure package, well, I can't say that, will not be available or receives a resale certificate disclosure package that is not in conformity with the provisions of the Condominium Act is hand delivered delivered by electronic means or delivered by a commercial overnight delivery service or the United States Postal Service and a receipt obtained, okay, within six days or up to 10 days if extended by a ratified real estate contract after the postmark date if resale certificate disclosure package notice that the resale certificate disclosure <laughs> We'll call that the CDP now, will not be available or receive a CDP package not in conformity with the provisions of the Condominium Association is sent to the buyer in the United States mail. So that's where it's a little bit bigger, longer because of the United States mail. Most of us don't do that anymore. When we get into the listing agreement, I'll say it now, but you always want to ask for it in electronic form, okay? And if they send it to you because they say, we don't have electronic form and they give you the big bound notebook, I would just scan it in at work and send it that way. Because <laughs> most of us don't want to carry around big stacks of paper. It's easier to find information. So anytime prior to settlement, if buyer has not been notified that the resale, <laughs> the <laughs> RCDP <laughs> will not be available, the RCDP <laughs> is not delivered to the buyer. So at any time, if the buyer never receives it, right. then they can uh, void the contract without penalty, okay? Up to so. Up to settlement, right. So notice of cancellation shall be provided to seller by one of the following methods. Hand delivery, United States mail, postage prepaid, provided the sender retains sufficient proof of mailing, which would be certified return receipt, which may either be a United States Postal Certificate of Mailing, a certificate of service provided by the sender confirming such mailing, electronic means, provided the sender retains sufficient proof of electronic delivery. So how do you get sufficient proof of electronic delivery? You ask for them to acknowledge your email. I do have them things where it's functions. If you want, if you open the email I send you, it kicks back to me automatically. Yes, you and you can do that as as uh, Derek was saying, set it to show that someone's opened it, and they'll say, "Well, my kid opened it, right?" <laughs> <laughs> my dog opened it. Okay, so um, so like trying to deliver your confirmation that the notice was sent by facsimile, which most of us never do, but you never know or certificate of service prepared by the sender confirming the electronic delivery, overnight delivery using commercial services, U.S. Postal Service, FedEx, UPS, and the like, okay? Broker can help, can cancel, broker can counsel buyer on real estate matters, but if legal advice is desired with respect to the contents of the RCDP, buyer is advised to seek legal counsel. So basically, you as an agent, you say to your buyer, you know, you have their made through this and, and let them know that every package they get for every neighborhood they're going to live in, there's things that are different. They need to pay attention to these things if they matter to them. So if they're, they're and I say Marine because I have a friend who's a Marine and, and flies his Marine flag all the time. Uh, if he were moving into a neighborhood that would allow that, then he might change his mind if that's 
that not to live there, okay? If that if they did not allow those flags to be flown all the time, okay? So you know, this is for informational purpose for them. They're signing it, saying that they received it, okay? So you so just saying buyers. Right, right. It's so just a buyer. Document. The broker doesn't sign it. Rights, I do not sign. No, you don't sign any of it. Remember, the agreement is between the buyer and the broker. Yeah. You're just memorialized on that last page. Memorial. Yeah, you're just designated. <laughs> so, yeah, so because Virginia does require this, it's not an agreement with the broker. It's, this, is what women's required. Yeah. <laughs> this is strictly informational purposes only, but we want the buyer to say, yes, I received it, okay? Okay, useful information about real estate transactions. Realtor, our real estate licensees who, as members of the National Association of Realtors, as well as the state and local association of realtors, have pledged to the public and to each other that we will adhere to the strict code of ethics and high standards of professionalism, integrity, and competence. Realtors are providing you with this information in order to assist you in making informed decisions when purchasing, selling, or obtaining real estate. So if the client didn't know what a realtor was, they can now read this and understand. Okay, now just for clarity, <laughs> not for realize, on the table of contents, I am checking off number two of the six things uh -huh. that the buyer, yes. part of the buyer's package, I want your acknowledgement that we have completed understanding your rights under the VA Conditional slash POA Act. Correct. Also known as the HOA. Right. Okay, and we're on number three. Right. Useful information about real estate. Right, we're on page 19, yes. 19, right. Yeah. Right, right. So when you pass your real estate license, you're not a realtor until you join the National Association of Realtors, okay? But you can't do that until you are, get your license. Right. You get your license, and then you have to join the association, then you can join the MLS. But that's why I'm right now, I'm like, between, between. Right, because of COVID. Yeah, it's a test, but yeah. no one knows it. Yeah. It's a trade secret. Right, because of COVID, everything's being delayed. Oh, right? oh they're coming to see you. Here comes, here comes, <laughs> coming to see you, baby. Here comes COVID again. Yeah. Oh, the whole world stops. Yeah, I know what I'm telling you. They're coming right. to see you. All right, so services. All right. <laughs> Regardless of whom they represent, yeah, the realtors yeah. can provide a variety of information and assistance to all parties in a real estate transaction. For example, realtors can assist customers by performing ministerial acts, such as supplying information about available properties and sources of financing, describing and showing properties, assisting in preparing and submitting purchase offers or count offers, or providing information about settlement procedures. Realtors acting as standard agents are required by the Virginia law and by the Code of Ethics to treat all parties honestly and not knowingly give them false information. Promptly present all written offers and counter offers. <clears throat> Disclose any adverse material defects or facts actually known to them concerning the physical condition of the property and offer properties without regard to race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial status, elderliness, sexual orientation, national origin, or gender identity, as well as any other classes protected by Virginia and applicable jurisdiction. Legal requirements. Virginia law requires that in order to be enforceable, all contracts for real estate must be in writing. This is recommended this is a recommended contract form that can be shown to you and that may be modified in any way to accommodate the needs of the parties. You have the opportunity to consult legal counsel concerning the contract as well as any other questions you may have about the various laws concerning real estate transfers that are referenced in the suggested contract form. So this is telling your buyers it has to be in writing and your sellers, because they get this one as well. We will not read it again, I promise you. Um, <laughs> but you can kind of, you know, point to some of these things when people, especially like I told the other day, when the attorneys are your clients and they're not real estate attorneys and they want to make changes, no. Um, they, because then what would happen is their buyer would then have to seek legal counsel. 
because they're changing up the form and, and, and we are not attorneys, therefore we could not comment to what was made, changes were made to, okay? So financing, mortgage rates and associated charges vary with financial institutions and the marketplace. Buyers have the opportunity to select a lender and to negotiate terms and conditions of the loan. Such terms may be subject to the seller's approval and lender's requirements. Buyers also will be required to obtain a lender's title insurance policy for the lender. Buyer may wish to obtain owner's title insurance coverage and may consult an attorney concerning this choice. Insurance. The lender may require buyers to buy a hazard insurance policy for the insurance company of their choice subject to the lender's approval. Buyers should be aware that many factors affect the availability and cost of the hazard insurance of the property. Depending on the insurance company, these factors may include past insurance claims filed on the premises, past insurance claims filed by the buyer, and a buyer's credit history. In addition, flood insurance may be required on the property. Buyers should contact an insurance agent at the earliest opportunity to arrange for hazard insurance if necessary flood insurance on the property. Now, if you are a listing agent and you have a property that requires flood insurance, make sure you put that in the listing, okay? Because when someone's going to look at property, they have to know up front if they're gonna to have to pay several more grand a year for insurance because of that property. And you as a buyer's agent, you don't wanna show property to your clients if, if they have flood insurance and they can't afford the flood insurance, okay? I had a listing in Fairfax and it was 3,000 a month, 3,000 a year for flood insurance. Okay. So we had to make sure everybody understood that. And oftentimes um, the agents don't read the listings and they don't share with their clients. So the buyers are surprised to find out that there's flood insurance there. So buyer and seller duties under FERPTA section 1445 of the internal revenue service code. The Foreign Investment and Real Property Act, Tax Act, FERPTA, may impose a duty on a buyer to withhold a percentage of 15% of the gross sales price when the seller is a foreign person for the purposes of U.S. income taxation and when the property is located within the United States. A foreign person includes but is not limited to a non-resident alien, foreign corporations, foreign partnerships, foreign trusts, and foreign estates. The seller has to check the right box in the residential sales contract and attach a FERPTA addendum to the contract. In addition, although I couldn't find the FERPTA addendum the other day and I don't know if it changed. And when was this form done? So this is an old form. I'm not so sure we have the FERPTA addendum or it didn't come out. So I need to check on that. No, FERPTA, not RESPA. Okay, so um, make myself a note about that because uh, I was working on one, we were asking them and they said they needed a FERPTA. So they were working on finding that. Okay, uh, in addition, the seller should inform the settlement agent of possible withholding under FERPTA prior to settlement date. The settlement agent may require the seller and the buyer to execute certain IRS forms which may include the seller and the buyer's tax identification number, social security number, and submit the required withholdings on behalf of the buyer. Both the seller and the buyer should seek competent legal tax or financial advice concerning these matters in advance of settlement. So bottom line, if your seller qualifies under a FERPTA, make sure everyone knows up front, make sure the title company knows and they can start working on all the documentation for FERPTA. It only matters truly if they haven't paid taxes on the property during the time that they've owned it. And that's where it becomes an issue. And your title companies will often teach on FERPTA. So if you want to know more about it, keep an eye out for those classes. Master plans. Prior to execution of a contract, buyer may review the applicable master plan for the appropriate jurisdiction, including maps showing planned land use and proposed or actual parks, roads, or other facilities. These can be found at the planning office of various jurisdictions and some local libraries. Now, does anyone see in here that where it says, <laughs> now, we're talking Virginia right now, not Maryland, that you as an agent need to provide this information to your client, okay? 
So be careful what line you cross there. If they really want to know what's going on, they should check. Because you may have heard that a gas station is going on the corner. And maybe that was what was happening six months ago, but that's all changed now. And it's going to be a Lidl's grocery store. Okay? So you got to be careful what you tell your client. You can just send them. They can go to the planning office to determine what's actually going on behind uh, when they see road work being done. Okay? How I live, we've, we've heard that there's anywhere from 400 to 800 homes going in, multiple use. You know, no one knows what's going on there. And um, now because of COVID, we can't even go and look at the plans. <laughs> but they're tearing up the road, we know that. So uh, property condition and environmental matters. Various inspection services and home warranty insurance programs are available. Okay, and that's your choice your 210, your um, CENCH, which was um, HMS before, okay? And uh, buyers have the option to include in their offer to purchase a contingency that allows them, them to employ one or more experts of their choice at their expense to inspect the property and provide them with an analysis of the condition. Buyers normally may also conduct a pre-settlement or pre-occupancy walkthrough inspection of the property, but these inspections may be limited by the terms of the contract. Realtors do not have the expertise or advice to advise concerning various conditions, including but not limited to major systems or structures, soil conditions, flood hazard areas, mold, air quality, possible restrictions, on the use of the property due to restrictive covenants. Starting supervision, environmental laws, easements or other documents, airport or aircraft noise. So no, in our, you know, around here there's airports everywhere and uh, you cannot guarantee that a plane is not gonna fly over the house. You know, it's not your job to do that, okay? Um, so when asked, just ask them to look into it for themselves, okay? Um, road highways, including but not limited to construction materials or hazardous materials such as flame retardant, tree to plywood, FRT, radon, urea, formaldehyde, insulation, polybutylene pipes, asbestos, synthetic stucco, underground storage tanks, defective drywall, or lead-based paint. Information about these issues may be obtained from appropriate governmental agencies such as the United States Environmental Protection Agency and the Virginia Department of Health and their local planning offices. Home energy efficiency information. Buyers may wish to consider the energy efficiency of any new or existing home prior to the conclusion of the sale. Hiring an energy audit professional certified by the Residential Energy Service Network or the Building Performance Institute to perform an energy audit can be an invaluable step toward helping prospective buyers understand the energy efficiency low level of the home they are considering buying. Energy and water consumption patterns in the home can also add to the understanding of the efficiency levels of the home system units. All their personal behaviors must also be considered when evaluating this data. Now, in Maryland and DC often, uh, that is something that's required where they give a utility a 12 month snapshot of all the utilities and their cost. And, and then oftentimes you'll see follow up questions on how many are in the household. So if your client in Virginia, your buyer wants to know, excuse me, wants to know that, certainly ask the listing agent if their client could provide that information for them. It hey, used to be, used, used, go ahead. Um, go ahead and then I want to bring up a point from earlier. Finish your okay. Uh, well, in the past, we used to be able, to, an individual used to be able to call any utility company and say, I was just curious what, you know, what the cost was per annum at that property because of privacy acts and stuff now. Even as agents back in the 2000s are working for agents, mm -hmm. like transaction coordinators, we used to call all the time and get information. Uh, most utility companies won't give it to us anymore. Go ahead. Yeah, back on the environmental matters. Um, uh -huh. Fredericksburg, you also need to be aware of the noise, the firing range noise from Quantico and Dahlgren um, military bases. They have active uh, fire 
live fire ranges and some buyers get really ticked when they find out, oh, that I can hear Quantico. I can hear Dahlgren. Um, although the, the installations release their training schedules, that is one of those issues. And I know they didn't actually, you know, they talk about aircraft noise. It's also, uh, this is not aircraft, this is gunfire. Yep. And artillery and bombs. That was the high beat target practices every weekend. <laughs> yep, especially on, especially on uh, uh, low air pressure days. They're really loud. Because I'm right like there. around Manassas and um, in the Centerville area around the battlefield. Yeah, so when you do know about places like that, it's, it's worth letting your client know about it. So, um, and then out in the country where people hunt too. You know, if you have a client moving, and I don't mean any slur about it, but if you're moving from the city environment to a country environment, just know that the gunfire does travel. I mean, the sound of it travels a great distance. So, um, you let people know that there are hunters around as well in certain parts. So, um, okay, types of real estate representation. And depending on how far out, they need to be sure, you know, they, you know, it doesn't hurt to be aware that, you know, I grew up in an area, you didn't go out as a little kid in the fall, very far right, from the right. house. Right. Right. Yeah, so every county is different. Every jurisdiction is different as to how close they can shoot and if houses are around. So, okay, types of real estate representation. In an individual real estate transaction, if a broker, firm, broker, has a contractual obligation to represent a buyer or a seller client, then the broker shall promote the interest of the client by exercising ordinary care and by performing the terms of the contractual agreement, conducting marketing activities on behalf of the client as provided in the brokerage agreement, assisting the client in drafting and negotiating offers and counter offers, amendments, addenda, and in establishing strategies to accomplish the client's goal. So let me explain the difference between an amendment and an addenda. Now in Virginia real estate right now, it's pretty much one thing, but in truth, an amendment is when you're, you're mending. See the word mend? You're mending something like my shirt has a hole in it and I'm gonna mend it. That's an amendment. And an addenda is I'm adding to it. My shirt doesn't have a pocket, so I'm gonna add a pocket to my shirt. So if you look at the two words, amend and add, and add, so that gives you a clue as to what you're doing. So when you're amending a contract, okay, you're taking the same piece of paper, you're making a change to it somewhere, like an account offer, and then you're gonna, whether you cross hatch or just collect all the initials that are required. If there's two buyers and two sellers, it's four sets of initials, okay? If it's one of each, it's just two initials. So you gotta, Always be in mind how many buyers, how many sellers, and as you go down through a counter offer, make sure you're capturing and, and collecting all the necessary initials to any amendment, okay? And then amendment also can be, um, you know, you're at, which is really an addendum, but they use the words interchangeably. Then when you start adding pages to it, you're adding to the contract, okay? and establishing strategies to accomplish the client's goal, obtaining a transaction at a price and term acceptable to the client. Now, some of them don't wanna believe that it's acceptable and they wanna fight you over it, but you're the professional. And for the newer agents, don't think you're in alone on this. You go to your mentors, your coaches, your brokers, and you and, and experienced agents in the office, and they help you run comps and understand because every home is different in neighborhoods. Sometimes you're in a cookie cutter neighborhood and it's easier, sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're in a cookie cutter neighborhood, but your client has done some. Thousand on it, but in an appraiser's mind, it may only be, um, says I'm unstable. <laughs> um, an appraiser, for an appraiser, it may only be 30,000. So you gotta be, you know, and it's not your job to um, tell your client, oh yes, go spend 60,000, fix up the kitchen. You'll get it back, not necessarily, okay? So be careful about that as well. But as new agents, um, do not hesitate to ask for help when copying a property, especially the listing. 
uh, anything. And then also on the buyer side, if you are showing property and you're you're not sure if it's overpriced or not, there again, you need to do comparables for the area and have some experienced agents, a mentor, somebody help you through that process, okay? All right, unless otherwise provided by law or the client consents, consents in writing to the release of information, the broker shall maintain the confidentiality of all personal and financial information and other matters identified as confidential by the client if that information is received from the client during the broker's relationship. Now, the client tells the agent, i.e. the broker, please let everybody know about my house in your office and tell them all the details and also tell them, you know, um, whatever. If they're giving you permission to share it, by all means share it, but if they're saying you don't share it, you can't share it, okay? You don't put it on MLS, you don't share it with anybody. Like if they say, I'm willing to go down 20,000, you don't share that with the office, okay? Not even your best friend in the office, you don't do that. And satisfying these duties, the broker shall exercise ordinary care. Well, let me back up. So let's say your client says they're willing to go down 20,000 and you've got a, an associate in the office or even an agent that calls you up and says, uh, is there an offer in hand? You say no. Will your client accept an offer less than ask price? Now you don't want to say yes, but you can say, please present your offer. I'll present it to my client. That's all you have to say. You don't have to sit there and him and haul and give it away that they would. Just say, please present your offer in writing and I'll present it to my client, okay? So in satisfying these duties, the broker shall exercise extraordinary care, comply with all applicable laws and regulations, treat all prospective buyers and sellers honestly, and not knowingly give false information, and the broker representative buyer shall disclose whether or not the buyer's intent is to occupy the property as a principal residence. In addition, the broker may show the same property to different buyer clients, represent sellers as well as buyers, or provide assistance to a seller or a buyer who is not a client by performing ministerial acts that are not inconsistent with the broker's duties to the client. When you're filling out a contract, and I'll get to that when we do the contracts as well, but there's a place that says buyer will or will not occupy. Will means they're gonna be the homeowner that's living there. Will not means they're gonna be an investor. Whether it's their kids are gonna live there or they're gonna rent it up to some strangers. And it matters to a lender, but more importantly, it matters, especially when it's condos and HOAs and especially in condos, when there's an owner to investment ratio. So you don't wanna get into an, an offer and get up to near closing and it get canceled because it's going to turn out to be someone who's investing in the property. Okay. So you want to know that up front. So oftentimes agents will forget to do it or they do it on purpose, hoping it'll slide by. You as a listing agent need to make sure you ask that to be filled in. Seller represent, representation occurs when sellers contract to use the services of their own broker known as a seller representative or a listing broker to act on behalf Sellers may engage a broker who provides standard services or limited services. Your realtors can provide you with more information about these options. We are standard agents. We are not limited service agents. I'm sure you can be if you want to be, but limited service agents, um, someone called me yesterday, I think it was, and said, it says online that we're supposed to call the owner. Is that right? I'm like, does it say limited service? She goes, yes, I said, that's why. The agent is taking the listing and putting it in the MLS for probably for a flat fee and you have to deal with the owner for everything else. So that person is not fully being represented um, by their agent, it's just limited services. They're not even looking at the contract, they're asking you to send it on to that homeowner, okay? Buyer representation occurs from buyer's contract to use the services of their own broker known as a buyer representative or a selling agent, both, same thing, to act on their behalf. Buyers may engage a broker who provides standard services or limited services, okay? There again, we're standard, we're, we're fully helping our agent. 
dual represent now we've already talked about dual and designated we did that in the buyer's agreement so i'm not going to reread those and then you're going to get your clients to sign here okay again these last two documents are truly informational purposes only for your buyer okay uh, now this document is new well it's not new new but it's now required so it's it's the four page residential property disclosure statement. Okay. And um, so it's more than just the DPOR document that our clients sign that we get from the listing. This is four pages of what it means and it's now required to be given to the client and to obtain their signature. Or I think it's their, I don't think they put the signature line in. So I would just, have them initial it when you upload it into um, yeah yeah so yeah I would just um, pop their their initials or signatures at the bottom of it okay all right condition the owner of the residential real estate property makes no representation or warranties as to the condition of the real property or any improvements thereon or with regard to any covenants and restrictions or any conveyances of mineral rights as may be recorded among the land records affecting the real property or any improvements thereon. And purchasers are advised to exercise whatever due diligence a particular purchaser deems necessary, including obtaining a home inspection as defined in the code and a residential building energy analysis as defined in accordance with the terms and conditions as may be contained in the real estate purchase contract, but in any event prior to settlement pursuant to such contract. So Virginia is a buyer beware state. So right up front, that deeper document that those who've been around who may have had a deal that the seller signs and it gives you that little line to look up, this is where it takes the clients. But people aren't doing that. They're not looking it up. So there's been a lot of, oh, sorry. There's been a lot of cause, you know, issues about, um, are you guys still seeing that? Can you guys still see the screen? Okay. I know it's here, but okay, I thank you. Um, but anyway, um, so people are getting upset because they think the seller's hiding stuff and they could be hiding it, but the Virginia doesn't say they have to, but you as agents have to tell, okay? It's a disclaimer. I'm not saying that everything is great, but I ain't saying nothing is bad. So if they find something that wasn't ours high, right. I said as is. It's just a basic as is. Right. Adjacent parcels. The owners make no representation with respect to any matters that may pertain to parcels adjacent to the subject property, including zoning classifications or permitted use of adjacent parcels and purchasers are advised to exercise whatever due diligence a particular purchaser deems necessary with respect to adjacent parcels in accordance with the terms of conditions as may be contained in the real estate purchase contract but in any event prior to settlement pursuant to such contract so adjacent parcel let's say there's empty land next door and there's skull but like i said that it's going to be a gas station it's going to be a store it's going to be a religious center it's going to be a kids a teenage group whatever you know, um, the seller is not obligated, nor can they be held to any accountability as to what that's going to be. And depending on what it is, may or may not affect the seller of their property, but they have the buyer has to go do their due diligence, okay? Historic district ordinances. The owners makes no representation to any matters that pertain to whether the provisions of any historic district ordinance affect the property and purchasers are advised to exercise whatever due diligence a particular purchaser deems necessary with respect to any historic district designated by the locality pursuant to including review of any legal ordinances created such districts, any official map adopted by the locality depicting historic districts and any material available from the locality that explain any requirements to alter, reconstruct, renovate, restore, or demolish buildings or signs in a local historic district and the necessity of any local review board or governing body approvals prior to doing any work on a property located in a local 
the circle district in accordance with the terms and conditions as may be contained in the real estate purchase contract, but in any event prior to settlement. We live in Virginia, the first state that was settled. We're historic everywhere. <laughs> and some homes are still preserved as historic sites. So um, again, I, I sold a property in Fairfax that had a um, historic Civil War era um, little shed thing in the back. We had to disclose it, but the historical society could care less that it was there. My client, when she bought it, had it checked out, but it was part of the disclosure. We had to disclose that that's what the little building was and uh, that they had the right to tear it down if they chose to. Okay, uh, resource protection areas. Okay, the owner makes no representation with respect to whether the property contains any resource protection areas established and an ordinance implementing the Chesapeake Bay Preservation Act. Remember, this is all of Virginia, adopted by the locality where the property is located and purchasers are advised to exercise whatever the due diligence a particular purchaser deems necessary to determine whether the provision of any such ordinance affects the property. Again, do it beforehand. Sexual offenders. <clears throat> The owner makes no representation with respect to information on any sexual offenders. We talked about this in the buyer's agreement. You just give them that link to go to and let them do it themselves. Okay. Dam break inundation zones. The owner makes no representation with respect to whether the property is within a dam break inundation zone and purchases are advised to exercise whatever due diligence that are deemed necessary. Well, more than likely they're going to need flood insurance, right? Wastewater system, the owner makes no representation with respect to the presence of any wastewater systems, including the type and size thereof associated with maintenance responsibilities related thereto located on the property and purchasers are advised to exercise whatever due diligence they seem necessary to determine the presence of a wastewater system. So solar energy collection devices, the owner makes no representation with respect to any right to install or use solar collected sites, okay? Question came up yesterday, uh, an agent asked, sent me a message requesting information. They needed an addendum from Maryland. Um, what page are we on? We're on page 24. Um, and wanted to know what addendum was uh, they could use so that the seller could convey the solar panels to the purchaser. And I said, well, if they're attached, they convey. And she goes, and then she came back and says, well, no, they're leased. I said, well, if they're leased, the seller has no right to convey them. <laughs> so she was trying to assign payment. <laughs> so, so, you know, so, there's, there's, so that's what should have been in the online listing was that, oh, okay. the, that they were leased items. The solar panels were leased items, okay? I so special fund been... hazard areas. I'm sorry? I guess you might have had to deal with it like you do um, uh, gas um, right. fuel tank. Right, like a propane tank. Exactly. You know. Yeah, yep. right, exactly. Yeah. So you just have to, the lease, you, you, the buyer then engages with the leasing company. Everything stays in place, they just take it up. Same with alarm systems that they want to keep their, um, they want to keep the security system. Okay, the owner makes no representations with respect to whether the property is located in one or more special flood hazard areas and purchases are advised to exercise whatever due diligence they deem necessary, including obtaining flood certificate or mortgage lender determination of whether the property is located in one or more special flood areas. Reviewing any map depicting special flood areas containing the Federal Emergency Management Agency, FEMA, or visiting the websites. Okay. The seller should know that they're paying flood insurance and um, and you have to pass that along and and then there's a certificate. So once they come out of a flood zone, someone has to apply to FEMA and the county to get removed from that flood zone, you know, if it hasn't flooded in 100 years or something. Okay. Conservation or other easements. The owner makes no representation with respect to whether the property is subject to one or more conservation or other easements and purchaser are advised to exercise whatever due diligence a particular purchaser deems necessary in accordance with terms contained. So, you know, when it comes to um, 
conservation. You know, we just don't know what's in every area we sell. So even some sellers may not know that there's some conservation thing of a particular animal in their area. So, so that's why they can't warrant it. Things get put on the endangered list and off the endangered list and all that stuff all the time. Community Development Authority. The owner makes no res representation with respect to whether the property is subject to a community development authority approved by a local governing body pursuant to the article and purchasers are advised to exercise any due diligence of a particular purchaser deems necessary in accordance with the terms and conditions as to may contain the real estate purchase contract. Okay, including determining whether a copy of the resolution or ordinances has been recorded with the land records. So when you, we get to the contract, you're going to see where it says that they have to abide by HOA condo and any ordinances in Virginia. Okay, let's take a break and we'll come back at two o'clock. That gives you 13 minutes to stretch. <laughs> My guys are in here falling asleep. <laughs> I'm sure there's many people out there falling asleep too. <laughs> I can take a couple questions if anybody has any questions they want to ask. Uh, Deb, I said I found the uh, the federal tax form for the FIFA or whatever that is. I emailed FIFA? it. To you. Oh. It's in your email. Well, no. Did you find it in doc in uh, command? No, haven't found it there. Have to look. Have, That's what I'm saying. It's it's recently. Recently. <laughs> huh? I'm still trying uh, to figure it, this command. Well, it wasn't in zip forms either, and I was wondering if it. If they were changing it. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, no. We've had we had an agenda before, but I noticed it was missing the other day. So someone else needed it. I didn't really need it. I was trying to help them find it. Yeah. See if I can find it. See if I can outsmart the system. Ah. Uh. Half the battle is being smarter than the technology.
Barbara, what you found online is the IRS code. That's not the addendum. Okay. That's just strange with all the changes in July. I'm just wondering if that got missed somewhere along the way. I'm going to go out to NBAR and see if it's on their site. Hey, where, how do I, I'm just starting to set up my, my documents and all that. Where do I find them? And, and command? Yeah, do you know? Um, Which, well, it's, it's in your DocuSign. Yeah. So they're called rooms. Yeah. Under so what? I think in, so in command, you, you set up your DocuSign. Have you done that yet? Yes, I did. I, um, I got that hooked up. Right. So then when you set it, when you're setting up your clients and stuff, you go into, you go into the DocuSign and all your documents are there. Okay. So I, can I preset that stuff so that if and I have a, a client, it's all, I've already populated folders with all that in? Well, the office already has. Uh, I thought it's set up. Yeah, it has set up what you need for each one. Um, in this office, I don't know if it's Cassie who talked to you about that. The DocuSign? Yeah. That's Casey. I mean, Casey. Casey. Yeah, Casey. We, hold on. We have DocuSign. It's in command. Right. Casey can help you with it. Right. So Casey would be the one yeah. to help you navigate through that. Yeah, I'm going to have to get a hold of because I'm like, okay, you know, like, where are the, like, I'd like to be able to pull up the document so I can review it again or go ahead and pre-populate all of my name stuff and all that. So it's all set. You know, the, like the, right. You know, you know, if I don't have a client, that doesn't mean I can't go ahead and do that. Right. And you can always, you know, I don't, you can check with her about pretending to have a client and practice like even boot camp. Just mm -hmm. call it boot camp. <laughs> Um, you can't practice or something. Like I said half the battle is outsmarting the technology. <laughs> when you do that, it's like, oh wow, this is easy now. We're still on break for about another five minutes. We're on break. Yeah. <laughs> we have break. Yeah, we're break. Okay. Yeah. A few more minutes. So I have to stop and do breaks for you guys because I would just keep talking. <laughs> now, I do notice on the document that we're currently discussing. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, there is no place for anybody to sign it. No. Is that correct? Correct. So that's what I'm saying. There's no acknowledgement that we're doing. But so that's what I'm saying. We'll just have. I would just have you bring in those signatures on that. On the. Uh, yeah. Good idea to have them sign and date this. Right. I have received a copy. Is that correct? Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's four pages. Through page twenty-six. Well, that, so the additional written disclosure requirements. It's part, part of, of it, yeah. Document. Yeah, it was four page document. Two, yep. So I have received a copy. 
of the residential property disclose their statement provided by the Virginia Real Estate Board? I don't, I don't so, know. Right now, so since you're new around here and as other people are, uh, when you um, when you're a buyer making an offer, the seller has to provide to you what's on page 41, and we'll get to that a little bit later, so you understand what we're talking about. So it just simply says, you know, residential property disclosure statement, but it doesn't really say much, but it gives a link which takes you to this full disclosure. Okay, on page 41. But this is something that the seller has to So the seller has to sign this one document on page the 41. Seller has to sign the document and it has to be provided to you. Acknowledgement by seller and purchaser. Right. So the seller has to sign it. A purchaser doesn't sign a blank one. You get it from the seller when you're making an offer and see that high familiar blue line yes. there. Yeah. So that, when you click on that, would take you to this expanded document that I'm reading. And <clears throat> I, uh, my guess is that there's been some controversy over the whole thing because people aren't reading it and they feel that that disclosure statement means nothing. Well, it, it, this thing is just telling you that the owner makes no representation over and over and over. Two-minute warning. Oh. No, it's two o'clock now. Yep. <laughs> All right, we're back on track here, people. Marine Clays. Yay! Okay, the owner makes no representation with respect to whether the property is located on or near deposits of marine clays. And purchasers are advised to exercise whatever due diligence in particular purchaser deems necessary in accordance with the terms and conditions as may be contained in the Real Estate Purchaser Act, including consulting public resources regarding local soil conditions and having the soil and structure conditions of the property analyzed by a qualified professional. Most of us have clay or rock. That's part of it. Most of our yards contain. Right on gas. So the owner makes no representation with respect to whether the property is located in a locality classified as zone one or zone two by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, EPA map of radon zones. And purchasers may, and purchasers are advised to exercise whatever due diligence they deem necessary to determine whether the property is located in such a zone, including reviewing the EPA's map or radon zones or visiting the EPA's radon information website. Visiting the Department, Virginia Department of Health's indoor radon program website, visiting the National Radon Proficiency Program website, visiting the National Radon Safety Board's website. <laughs> okay, so if you learn about radon, you have lots of options there or ordering a radon inspection in accordance with the terms and conditions as may be contained in the Real Estate Purchase Act may be done prior to the contract, so I'm gonna have contract. You never, ever, ever, ever tell your client not to get a radon inspection. Cause it is a natural occurring gas and your neighbor could have it and you may not and vice versa. Um, the home inspector, Donna Free and Associates, they did a home inspection in a three story condo and the one on the third story actually had radon. It was the way the pipes came up from the ground that brought it up. So, you know, depending on how the structure of the building is or something, but just be careful. Never advise someone not to do a radon inspection. They usually cost about $150 thereabouts. It's not a big deal, but um, that's a, someone's personal choice. 
I always ask, I always suggest, but they have to make the decision, okay? If, Mm -hmm. Residential property disclosure statement. So there are 16 paragraphs, if I may say. Mm -hmm. Every one of them begins with the owner makes no representation. Is that fair to say? Yeah, yeah. So is it further fair to say, or some some have a word to, about this document? Virginia is a buyer, we wear state. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to show you, and you're going to, I'm going to give you a copy with your side of the Virginia property disclosure statement that's giving you 16 examples where the owner is making the right decision. Correct. Is it fair to make a summary? I mean, yes. Without going into a whole spiel. Exactly. So what Jim is saying, okay, we I want them to sign it. I want right. to give, I want to get past this. I haven't sold anything. Right. I sold, and I'm not trying to move. No, I'm, I understand. I, I want to keep within. Right. I understand about compliance. I've lived 25 years with compliance. Oh, right. Goodness. 40. God bless. God bless. <laughs> no, no, Jim's making a good point. Just like with the other two documents, we don't need to read this to our client, but Jim made a good point that the client is going to have to sign a deport statement from the seller, basically saying they make no representation. This is the this is the link from that that takes you to the link from that document takes you to the statements that are on the deport site. This one they're having us give out now. So Jim was saying, we can just say to the client, this tags along with this other document that you're gonna sign when you make an offer. And it's 16 points stating that the, and it details what the seller does not uh, advise you on. And that's all you need to say to them. They can read it. It's all highlighted and stuff. I'm reading it to so you guys understand what it is you're going to share with your client. Defective drywall. Okay. The owners make no representation with respect to the existence of defective drywall on the property. Next. Go ahead, Barbara. Could you, would it be unreasonable to give this to them when they do the buyer's agreement? To say, I want this you to go ahead and give it to them. No, this is when you give it to them. It's part of your buyer's package. Yes. But but when they're before they found the prop before they find the property, and then you might give yes. them a second copy when they find it. Well, no, you know, just when you get when you give when you go through the buyer's agreement with them, you're going to give them these documents. You're okay. going to go through the buyer's agreement itself, kind of paragraph by paragraph or thought by thought, and go over what it means so they understand what they're signing. You're going to give them all these addenda. Added so documents that so come part and to the whole. I'm sorry? So they can go ahead and do their homework to be knowledgeable. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. So that when they find the property, they already know what they're looking at. They, they already have a knowledge of what they're supposed to be, at, the question they need to ask. Right. Right. Uh, for example, lead based paint. Um, in all the years I've been with Steve since 2001, it wasn't until a couple years ago that uh, it happened twice in a month that um, ages provided the lead-based paint EPA document to their clients who were moving here. This is the first time living in the United States. And um, they had never heard of lead-based paint in their countries. It just wasn't talked about. And so the document scared both of them because they both had small children. It scared them tremendously that they went ahead and had the test done. And of course, they scraped down and say, you know, there's the witness had been replaced and all this, but it became a big deal for them because the document itself scared them. So you can't explain to your client that it, the house has been remodeled, has been refurbished, whatever, because it was built before 1978, they have the right to do that inspection okay they pay for it and stuff like this you know then you know you don't know what drywall is there now the inspector when they do the home inspection they may or may not either but that's why this covers all of us we don't know what's there okay so lead pipes you know someone may have bought a house that had lead pipes they don't know they don't have lead pipes so they cannot warrant that there's lead pipes in the house okay the point is that the customer has a concern about any of these things. They investigate. They have to effectively right. find a specialist. Who that? That's what we're really saying. Right, right. 
We don't want to make a big deal about it. No. Something to scare the person. Right. But by due diligence, we must inform them right. that the owner is not making any representation regarding any of these areas. Right. It is up to you, Mr. Consumer, to follow up on any of these areas that may be of a specific concern to you. Correct. And um, that's why we do home inspections. You know, even if it's for uh, void, it's only for information purposes only. And they want to know what's in their house and around their house, okay? Right. So the owner doesn't represent uh, regarding pipes, lead based plumbing fittings, fixtures, solder, or flux that does not meet the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act definition of lead free. Any purchasers are advised to exercise whatever due diligence they deem necessary to determine whether the property contains any pipe or piping, plumbing, fitting, fixtures, solder, or flux that does not meet the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act definition, okay? They can hire someone to check the water supply. Uh, impounding structures and dams, the owner makes a representation with respect to the condition or regulatory status of impounding structure or dam on the property under the ownership of the common interest community that the owner of the property is required to join. The purchasers are advised to exercise whatever due diligence a particular purchaser deems necessary to determine the condition, regulatory status, cost of required maintenance and operation, or other relevant information pertaining to the impounding structure of a dam, including containing the Department of Conservation, Recreation, and licensed professional engineer. Okay, additional written disclosure requirements. Sellers and buyers may need to complete one or more of the following written disclosures. Okay, so here it is. <laughs> you may need to complete these. This information is provided as a resource and does not constitute a legal advice. The application, the applicable Virginia code section should be consulted before taking any action based on this information which is intended solely to provide an abridged overall or disclosure requirements and may not be applicable in all transactions. The entire code of Virginia is accessible online, searchable at, you should retain the, the, service, the services of attorney if you need legal advice or representation. First sale of a dwelling, okay? So the code contains other disclosure requirements for transfers involving the first sale of a dwelling. The first sale of a dwelling is exempt. Do you have a question? No. Do you have a question, Miller? Okay, all right, um, I saw a hand. <laughs> okay, um, the first sale of the dwelling because of the first sale of a dwelling is exempt from the disclosure requirements listed above. The builder of a new dwelling shall disclose in writing to the purchaser thereof all known material defects, which would constitute a violation of any applicable building code. Planning District 15. In addition, the property that is located wholly or partly in any locality comprising Planning District 15 the builder or owner, if the builder is not the owner of the property, shall disclose in writing any knowledge, whether mining operations have previously been conducted on the property or the presence of abandoned mine shafts or pits. So I don't know what planning district 15 is, <laughs> but it'll be in the tax record. If any defects are known by the builder to exist, uh, any written disclosure or requirements for the subject. Okay, so we've got um, all these different things here, different sections and ordinance violations that may require any extra uh, addenda. Okay, that's just listed for them to read. So I would definitely have my person just sign or initial this document stating that they've received the document, okay? So any questions about the buyer's package? If you go back to your table of contents and when you're looking in your command, your command should be set up to say these are required documents, okay? Now we haven't finished them all, right? There's still two more, right? 
So where does it tell us to go for those next two? We're going to pages 132, 134, 136, pages 131, 133, and 135. I'm going to bring up one of them, but basically each office has their own affiliations with other businesses, okay? So let me get there and then we'll go over it. We'll go over one of them, okay? Okay, here we go. So what's first here? So you have two protection, you get a home inspection. <laughs> okay, now this, so this is our, so there's a cyber notice for each office. So depending on which office you're in, the cyber notice is there telling you which, uh, you know, which one it is, okay? They all read a little bit differently perhaps, but I'll read this one. Keller Williams Realty hereby gives notice that Keller Williams Realty Falls Church has no control over the possibility of cyber crimes. All clients should take every action necessary to protect themselves and their personal information when using email or other electronic communications. Keller Williams Realty Falls Church and our associates will never request that you send funds or non-public information such as social security numbers, credit cards, or debit card numbers, or bank account and or routing numbers by email. It, uh, it, we're on page 140. Oh, I'm sorry. My numbers are off somehow. 140, don't read that high. I'm sorry, guys. Well, 140 does say cybersecurity. You're right, it's 140. I know, but in my table, contents is wrong. That's right. That's what um, Okay, I know what happened. Yeah. When I had to add in, when I was told I needed to add in the residential disclosure statement, it bought my numbers up. And I didn't catch those those that group of numbers. So anyway, I'm so sorry. I've got to correct that. I'll correct that and send it out in a PDF. Okay. Um, so anyway, so the cybersecurity knows for each office is that um, we as agents are not collecting money from our clients. Okay. A title company collects money for an earnest money deposit. When you're working with um, leases and stuff, um, they either wire funds to the office and they contact the office to get the wiring funds. The client can contact the office or you send the wire funds, the instructions to your client, or they take a check, okay? So cybersecurity, you're just letting your client know that if they let their stuff loose out there, we are not responsible for what goes on, okay? Besides that, we could take a, um could take their check for good service mm -hmm. money to put. I'm to sorry. Work. What is it called, babe? Uh, earnest money? earnest money. We can take their earnest money check, though, right? Yes. Okay. But we do our due diligence our best not to be the carrier of the earnest money deposit. You know, most yeah, most of the title companies would take wires. Uh, now, if someone's really dead set against using a wire from their bank because their bank might charge them too much, and if they want to do a check, then um, I would encourage them to deliver the check if they could, but if not, you need to pick it up and deliver it the same day. Do not hold on to it. Post-haste. Huh? Yeah, post-haste. Absolutely the same day. Do not hold on to it at all. The risk of it getting lost, torn up, misplaced is very high. Okay. When I did the deal in my finance office, a deal from the Senate, like, or a dealership, well, I thought I had a down payment, right? Uh, down payment is a down payment to finance in the majority of the car. Right. But what was my goal when I took that down payment? What was my goal? Get the bank. <laughs> Get rid of that down payment. Give it to another party to make them responsible right. for the down payment. Right. <laughs> so, yeah, we don't want to hold money as much. Now, oftentimes, what will happen is when you're working a deal with somebody, they'll write a check and send you a picture if they have a checking account. I don't have a checking account. Uh, well, I don't have a checking account. I don't carry checks. I don't have checks. I but asked then when it comes, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was saying I asked because when we bought our house, we were living in Maryland, and when we came down to Virginia to look at the houses, and we decided which one we wanted to put an offer on, um, it was easier for us to just leave the check with our agent because we live yes. in 
So that's why I was asking, like, if someone's moving from out of town and they're just coming down for the day or something and then decide, okay, I want to make an offer on this house, but they live so far away, they can't come back or they don't feel comfortable with sending things through the mail. That's how we end up giving our earnest money deposit to our agent. And there are times that you would do that. And as an agent, I would then right away get it to the title company in an envelope it says holding pending offer or holding pending deal ratification. So they're not gonna process it yet until you tell them to, but you really wanna get it out of your hands, okay? Unless you have a safe place that you can lock it or someplace in your office, but you just need to remember where you put it, okay? There's been too many horror stories of agents losing um, earnest money checks. And then they're embarrassed to go back to their client and then it doesn't get deposited in a timely manner and then it just goes bad from there, okay? So the other thing that each office has is the affiliated business disclosure. And um, this one is for Falls Church. Um, so in your book, it should be page 141, but that's not what's in the table of contents. Um, and I thought I looked through all that. So, um, what it is, is our offices have relationships with different entities. So in Falls Church, it says in connection with the purchase sale of this property, you may need to obtain certain settlement services. This is to give you notice that Keller Williams Realty Falls Church and some of its agents are members of and have business relationships with Universal Title Falls Church and with, um, so that's their full name, Keller Williams Falls Church and some of the agents have ownership with Universal Title Falls Church Founders LLC. And they own 49.9% of Universal Title Falls Church. Keller Williams Realty Falls Church has separate business relationships with Highlands Mortgage and with HMS Home Warranty, which we need to change that to cinch now. Some of the agents and employees of Keller Williams Realty have separate business relationships with SGS Property Management, LLC. All of these entities and the members of the UT Falls Church Founders, LLC, may receive financial or other benefits from this referral. Universal Title has, recommended, has been recommended for settlement services and title insurance. UT Falls Church LLC is a registered to do business as Universal Title Falls Church and is a fully licensed and bonded under the Real Estate Settlement Agency, RESA, in the Commonwealth of Virginia, the District of Columbia, and the State of Maryland. As a real estate settlement provider and a licensed title ins insurance agency, Universal Title is a title insurance agency and writes insurance for First American Title Insurance Company Title insurance rates for First American Title Insurance Company are listed below. The following is the estimated range of charges that the title insurance and settlement service provided by Universal Title. Now, Falls Church has different agreements than Fredericksburg, who have different agreements than Kingstown. So all your different agreements are in here. So make sure when you're, you know, when you pull up your own on your own command, you're going to have just agreements from your office. And are these currently worded properly? Well, the other thing is, she's... They're not worded properly, correct? No. To the yes. So when you're in command, you move for the one you need. Yeah. So the command, command is correct. Your command is correct, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing that's not right in this document is HMS has changed their name to Cinch, so we probably should update that one. Well, I'm talking about... On page oh, you mean they're not numbered property? No, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying sorry. the one that pertains to us. Okay. Right here. Okay. Page 142 and 143. Is that correct? Oh, yeah. So, so in this one, so Summer just has their name in there as an example. Oh, okay. On page 142, it's referring to Keller Williams Realty as opposed to Keller Williams Fredericksburg. I thought that was. Oh, I see what you're saying. See, on, on page nine, exclusive right to represent buyer agreement. You were very specific about having one. Keller Williams Realty, right. Insert firm word. 
So Jim is bringing up the situation where it says Keller Williams Realty, and it should say Keller Williams Realty, uh, Fredericksburg. Yeah. That's, that just got updated. Yeah. So. That's, that's what's happening now. Because we're just changing the names. It wasn't what happened, was happening yesterday, but it's what's happening now. Yeah. It's a good point, Jim. And then on for you guys that are here on page 143, Summer has just filled in as an example for people kind of what goes there, you know? So, um, but you, when you find it online, it's going to be a blank. But we all have different agreements with different companies. And we as agents, what, the, what your takeaway from all this is, is we as agents do not, do not, do not, do not have, um, we do not receive money directly from anyone. We don't get kickbacks. We don't get kickbacks unless you have, unless you have ownership in any of those, okay? So when, you know, when Keller Williams is a, a franchise, so, some of your fellow agents in the office and some of your leadership have ownership in the company. And when UT was established in the different locations and movement mortgage and different things, uh, and particularly with the title companies, some people, some of us were able to buy shares into that company. We benefit from your So we get a, right, we get a profit share, but we're not, but I get, for me, for example, yes. whether I have a deal at Universal Title every month or not, if they make a profit, I get a cut of it. Plain and simple. Um, so it doesn't mean, and I could send all my deals somewhere else, and I wouldn't. That would be stupid. <laughs> but you know, so that's that's the thing. Um, the profit share from the title companies is just simply that you share in the profit. You're not getting a kickback for any particular service, okay? So those of us who do have that share, our disclosure is a little bit different. We let people know that we do have an ownership share in that. Or not ownership, but an investment interest or whatever. Okay, so looking at your table of contents then. Yes. When you're doing your buyer's agreement, then when you're done, okay, so you've gone through all these, all these documents with your client, there's six of them, okay? You've spent time with your client going over the exclusive right to represent the buyer's agreement. You've spent really detail with that. You've highlighted the point of the next five documents. You don't read them to your client. You give them to them, let them peruse them, this is why I like to send stuff to my client ahead of time. If I know I'm going to meet him in a couple of days, I send a sample copy and I don't know if we can do that in command. Actually, I need to find that out. Um, we've used it for, for so long. You just don't put signatures. You still got to go in the dot loop. Go in the dot loop. Not dot loop. <laughs> dot, dot, dot loop. Dot sorry. I still say dot loop because that's what we was putting dot it, loop. Does it put the word sample across? I don't know. If we, you could write. Yeah, you could add text. Okay. Text. You just don't put the signatures. In right. Right. Okay. And you send it, and it'll go that way. You well, you always want to do a watermark of a sample as much as you can, so someone can't use those documents with somebody else. Oh, okay. I yeah. That. That's a great idea. When you're sending examples, so so if I'm sitting working with a buyer and we've had our buyer consultation, we filled out our forms whether they're signing on the phone or I turn my laptop around and have them sign there, uh, we get the document signed. And then what happens after that is those documents then are sent to the broker, Shannon or Steve, for their signatures. And then they come back and DocuSign. Now, that's when they're real. <laughs> and then in DocuSign, it goes to your client as well. However, I would suggest that you download it, put in a nice email to your client, sending them their package. So there's a record that they actually received their buyer's package and they're aware of it. You know, so just say, um, you know, we're, we're fully ratified, we're ready to go. While you're sitting there with them, you might 
you might be discussing what type homes are looking for. You bring up the multiple listing system. You can get them set up right then and there uh, with their search. And then I also give them a sample of the contract. We'll go over, um, uh, we'll, we'll do listings starting on Tuesday, where we, I give them a sample of the contract because I want them to understand what they're going to sign, especially in this market that everything's so fast and busy and we have multiple offers. You don't want to spend three hours going over a contract for the first time with your client when you're in a multiple offer situation. So if you spend some time with them and briefly go over the contract with them and let them know what they're going to see when it comes and how it's going to look and what they're going to, how they're going to sign it and fill it out. And by you sitting with them with DocuSign too, they understand it. Okay. If you can't be with them and you're Skyping or Zooming or FaceTiming or whatever, then um, you, know, you have it up on your screen, you're sh sharing with them. You sent them the document and you're going over it with them, okay? Um, I would suggest that you put the expiration date in your phone to remind yourself when it expires and then give yourself a three week, two week, one week notice of that expiration date because you need to get an, ext an extension on that expiration, okay? Uh, let's see. You also want to get them set up on your app. Talk to your tech person in your office about that. Uh, you're going to enter them into command. Uh, get them set. Well, you should have already had them in command because you produced the documents. So, um, but update any information that you don't have for them in command. Then uh, discuss your timing. You know, you're a business professional, so you want to make sure that. Um, how you work, explain to them how you work, when you work, what your available times are, and, uh, and find out from them how best they uh, receive information. Is it text, is it email, is it phone calls? Um, when there's more than one buyer or seller involved, always ask who, the, you, we all know there's a lead somewhere <laughs> in some situation. One party is particularly more, usually more involved or more on the ball, more in charge. Jim. <laughs> Jim says it's his wife. But anyway, uh, find out, you know, the person who wants to get the calls or text first. I've had clients who it's been, sometimes it's been the husband, sometimes it's the wife, singles, girlfriends, boyfriends, whomever. Sometimes it's just the one person. They just say, just send it to that and they'll let me know what's going on. And then when it comes time for signatures, that's different. But when it's communicating, now when it's communicating anything that's contractual, both people, okay? But when it's just checking in and finding out stuff. Uh, so then now in COVID times, what I wanna uh, talk to you about a little bit is that um, as agents, you cannot be lazy. You have to read everything that's in the listing online in MLS. You have to read what the other agent says needs to happen. If the other agent says mask, gloves, booties, hand sanitizer, bring your own wipes, whatever they say, you need to comply, okay? So take your time and read through that before you meet your client. Have that supplies with you. And those who are agents now who have already gotten their I've already joined MVAR or FAR or whomever, and you have your, do you, does FAR use central lock? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so you have your central lock key, and we also have the app, which is great, okay? But what about if you're in an area where the, the, the um, you can't get good cell service, and you didn't update your card that day, and you cannot open that lockbox? And then you have to stand there and you don't have good cell service. And so you can't even call Central Lock to update your card. You have to drive off somewhere and leave your client sitting there or you go figure out how to let them in the house. So I do caution you to update your Central Lock card. Uh, I know we're, you know, they would, it's great. I like the app. I use it all the time. But I can tell you, even in Northern Virginia, in McLean, Virginia, I have been in homes where I cannot get in with the central lockbox because of the internet. 
right there on Old Dominion Drive. So it's just sometimes it's bad, sometimes it's not. Sometimes there's storms, so you just always want to be prepared, okay? Um, so what I find out there a lot of times is there's many agents that do not spend time reading what the listing says. They're, they're um, speed racer getting ready. All they want to do is, oh, my client's interested in this home, boom, let's go. They've done no research before they've gone out to meet their client at that home. So, um, so make sure you read the listing, read what it says. Sometimes it's a combination code on the house and you have to reach out to the agent to get it because there's not a central lock box. Okay, again, woe is you who stands at the door without information in your hand, okay? Um, in these days of COVID, a lot of the places are not permitting non-decision makers to be in the home. So that's children, aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents, parents, best friend, etc. okay? So that's during the viewing time, that's during the uh, inspection. Sometimes they're asking for um, just online visits only, which means the agents allowed in the property only and they can FaceTime with you. So every situation is different, every listing is different, and every jurisdiction is different. And now we're kind of going back into some of the COVID stuff right now, more with, you know, a little bit more deeply um, with some of the spikes. So some of the loosed up restrictions might be back on. Same with open houses. Don't just send your client out to an open house because it comes up as open house. What does the open house say? Does it say virtual only? You know, you don't want your client, you don't want to say your client, oh, here's a list of open houses this weekend, and they get there and realize they can't get in, okay? So, um, do, your <laughs> do your due diligence, that's what you're being paid for. Now, three times in the last two weeks, this has happened, and I'm just shocked. Uh, so, um, yeah. I also do some transaction coordination still for a very few agents from days of old. And um, three times I've had buyer's agents send me their buyer's agreement along with the offer. Okay. Your buyer agreement is between the buyer and the broker. It never, ever, ever goes to the other side. Okay. Same with your listing agreement. The listing, and I've had that before. I've had a listing agreement sent back with the counter offer. I don't know how, I don't know why, but it's disturbing to me that agents are doing this. Oh, like they're just clicking. Yeah, they're just yeah, grabbing they're documents and sending them. I'm paying attention. Right. Why would my why, I have an agreement with you, you're my buyer. Right. You and I have an agreement. Why do I need to share that with the gentleman who owns the house? You don't. Right, you don't. You should never. Well, I'm not, I'm not no. sure. Is there any circumstance where that is? Really no, true? never. Never. No. And so, uh, and, and also, when you're making an offer, yes. you do not send the understanding, your rights, useful information, and the ABA in the cyber notice along with your offer. That is not required, okay? I find that a lot. I find agents will send that as part of the package too. They may not send the buyer's agreement, but they'll send the other five documents. I'm like, okay, we don't need to make this. And unfortunately, the buyer's agreement either, do they? unfortunately, these three situations were all Maryland situations and the agreements over there are already long enough. So when I get a, a, an offer that's almost a hundred pages long, it gives me a heart attack. <laughs> yeah, and, and then you just have to sort through and sort through and, and, and call through all this stuff. So those are just a couple of tips from experience when it comes to the buyer side. Anyone have any questions before I give some homework assignments? She did that. Uh, I'm having love for you. You messed it up, man. 
No questions? You messed it up. Up to date, you can go ahead and see it. You know, okay. she, 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 she pointed it out. Her last, oh, that was she gave us fair warning. She like, look, on Thursday, she gave us fair warning. She said, she, she, she yeah. put it out there, you know, like, look, I'm going to field test her. <laughs> According to my phone and my calendar, we have three weekends before the last day of class, okay? Now, again, we're in COVID and it may not be as easy, and some of you might be able to do it from the comfort of your home, but between now and the last day of class, the last day of class, so we have the 18th, the weekend of the 18th, the 25th, and the 1st. Okay, I would like you all to go to at least five open houses. Only one can be a Keller Williams open house, only one. Okay, the other four need to be other brokerages and preferably four other brokerages or at least four different agents. Whether it's virtual or in person. And go incognito if you can. Now, if you're asked point blank if you're an agent, then you need to say yes. And just say I'm previewing, previewing the home because that's what you're doing. But the purpose of the exercise, and some of you who've been with me before have done this, is to see what other agents are doing, how they're doing it, what's good, what's not good, what was effective, what impressed you, what didn't impress you, what um, offended you, frankly. Because um, you can ask someone to put on booties, wear a mask, wash their hands. It's how you do it, okay? Um, you can ask someone to hold their child in their hand while they're walking through the house. It's how you do it. You know, you might say something, for the safety of your beautiful daughter, do you mind holding her or holding her hand or holding her arms as we walk through the home? You know, you as the agent representing that client or the agent of the open house, those are things you should be doing. The kids that are coming in with parents, and like I said, with COVID right now, most people are blocking that. Uh, but um, you know, just be very careful. So one homework assignment is five open houses. Um, I would love to some brokers opens if they're in your area and you can see them. I would like you at least to try to get two brokers opens, but I understand that that may not be possible. Where do we find the open houses? Like where do we search on MLS or something? Okay, yes. So if you have access to MLS under Bright, there's an open house tab you click on and then you do a map search. So let's say on a Sunday, you and your family want to take a drive somewhere or you and your, your best friend and um, you just want to get out of the house. <laughs> so you can do a search in a neighborhood um, that you're just interested in. You want to know a little bit more about it. So, no, no. Well, I mean, so, I don't, right. I don't have any right. So, for Jim's situation and those who don't have access yet, go to your leadership in your office. Go to a fellow agent in the office and they can order a report for you. Just say, hey, can you tell me any open houses on the weekend of the 18th um, in this neighborhood, this neighborhood, or in this geographical area? And they'll just print them out for you. Okay. Yeah, that was open house. Broker. Broker, okay. Brokers opens usually happen on Tuesday. And that's usually not for the public. It's for other brokers to come and view a house. Now it used to be before it went on the market. The idea of a broker's open was before it went on the market, you would have a, an open house for people to come well, and view. Broker, I'm not <laughs> no one asked. But anyway. Yeah, they are, that concerned. But right now with brokers opens, you know, if they have them, it's a different type than an open house. You know, there's usually food served. Like that? Yeah. Open. yeah, it'll say brokers open. And that's where? On the MLS? Right. Mm -hmm. So you can check with. Are we limited by geographic area that you want us to go to? No, you're, you're in Virginia. No, no. Anywhere. If there was a reason, if I had one in Maryland, you there? Or you you can't go to Maryland as a Virginia agent to a brokers open. You can go to an open house. Open house. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. I'm yeah, yeah. No, you can go anywhere for an open house. It doesn't have to stay in Virginia. Because you're going not as an agent, you know, which which reminds me, 
I'll just say this real quick because this will happen to some of us. And it's happened to me. <laughs> so you're a Virginia agent, and the second client you get wants to live in Maryland or DC, and you want to rush and get your Maryland or DC license. Don't do it. Don't do it. Refer it off to somebody, especially the first time. And then um, if you ever ride along with that person into Maryland and DC, you're permitted to go along, but you're not permitted to talk about real estate. You can talk about the weather and dinner and everything else, but you're not permitted to talk about real estate at all because you're not a Maryland agent. You're a Virginia agent, okay? Um, you can't give advice. You can't, uh, can't be on a card that this house got sold or anything like that. So you got to be very careful about crossing those ethical lines from state to state, okay? Um, but wait a second. Now, this is important. It was my intention to work in this house. That within 30 days of getting my license and the old legal life back to go and get my Maryland license. Oh, you can do that. I want, to get, I want to knock it out and get it behind me. I want to be licensed in the DMV. That's right. my goal. Well, if, you want, if your goal is to be licensed in DMV, then do it. I'm not telling you not to. I am. No, no. What I'm saying is if you get a client, right. like your second client comes along and they want to go into Maryland, Okay. Just refer them. Refer them for the first time in Tattle Long. It's a lot of paperwork. It's a lot. And, oh, so, I, and I know many agents oh, who rushed out to get their license oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. for that one client and they right. never had any other client in that jurisdiction. Right. Okay. No, that's, so that's yeah. what I'm that's what I'm saying. Okay. I got it. All right. Okay, so we've got the homework assignment of the um, five open eight. houses, five open houses, two brokers if you can get it, two or three. And then for Monday, this Monday, write, I'm not sorry, Monday, Tuesday, write these two names down. John Jonas, J-O-N, and Jane Jonas, J-A-N-E-J-O-N-A-S, Jonas mm -hmm. is the last name, John Jonas and Jane Jonas. They are going to be your sellers, okay? J-O-N. J-O-N-J-O-N-A-S for the last name. Jonas is the last name. J O N. A-S. When I wrote this curriculum, my daughter was listening to the Jonas Brothers, what can I say? <laughs> John Jonas, J-O-N, and Jane Jonas. Right, so Jane and John are your sellers, okay? I'm sellers. Okay? Okay. So for this weekend, between now and Tuesday, well, actually, the reason I said Monday night, between now and Monday, Monday 5 p.m., if you have that to access to your forms through command, or if you're still using dot loop or zip forms, um, I would love for you to take a stab at doing the listing agreement yourself, okay? And send it to me in a PDF. It just helps me know where people are and things that, you know, really kind of talk about and pinpoint any mistakes. But we're going to walk through the listing agreement the same way we did the buyers. But you also get, you'll get an extra point in the hat for prize drawings, okay? So I've got a $10 Amazon gift card, okay? So for those who, by 5 p.m. on... Now, wait a minute. You want us to do a listing package? We haven't gone over. We just went over a. Bunch. No, I know you haven't gone over, oh, Jim. It's only a curveball. I tell you, lady. So you can read. There oh, you go. You got him. He can read. You can read. <laughs> you can use your <laughs> best. It's just sneaky, though. Let's be Let's just put this out in the open. That's right. Oh, yeah, Jim, actually. you're a car salesman from New York. You can handle it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you just got some support on that. Just told him to knock it off. So, so you can either take a, a, a listing agreement, go online and get a listing agreement, or make up one. Make up, make up the house, one, two, three, four Main Street. You are swimming with it. You come with a nice, scripty voice. Oh, yes, and it's just a wonderful world. By the way, we got to swim off the bridge. <laughs> I'm encouraging you to read. For those who have never read the listing agreement, reading is, fundamental. reading is fundamental. Just play around with it, you know? Okay, so now the listing agreement is 12 pages, okay? And I really want you to fill out. Everything. No. 
There's still six different. Oh, oh stop complaining. It used to be 16 pages. <laughs> <laughs> Do as much as you can. But I'm already 70. By the time I do my first close, I'll be 72. And all these if you can do up to page 32, which is the first four pages of the listing agreement, you'll get the drawing, okay? You actually got a copy of it. Yeah, I didn't see listing. I was just going to print one out. Yeah, so you can copy from your book if you don't have access to documents, or you can go online and do it. But if you can just send it to me in a PDF, you know? And uh, make yourself the. Um, Where is your email? Yeah, what is the email? Oh, you guys don't have my email? <laughs> Just see. Did I not send you guys an email today? I didn't see it though. <laughs> I didn't see it. it might have been a spam. I don't know. But, you know. My email address is Deb, and then R U, no, G E B. Okay. D E B R U E F, as in Frank dot kw at gmail.com so deb roof my my pet name and my last name dot kw at gmail.com at gmail.com okay. we're gonna be watching you okay and, uh, so that's homework for this weekend the open houses will run through the end of the term and we'll have prizes for that but for the first four pages of the listing agreement uh pass or fail it doesn't matter the fact that you did the project or put your names in a, a bowl on tuesday we'll draw the name and the lucky winner gets the ten dollar amazon gift card we need to bring back to you from the open house uh, okay, in regard to open house, it is the honor system. You're ethical or you're not. So what we do is on yeah, I know. On Tuesday, usually the first 10 minutes of the class in the olden days when we were out moving around much more, we would just chat about what everyone, you know, those who went to an open house and what good, bad, or different was. Okay. So you don't have to bring anything back to me. Some people grab a business card or jot on the back of it um, what they remember from the open house, and that's really just for your purposes or if they have a flyer. But in these days of COVID, I don't know what they have anymore. You know? This is really, really sounds stupid. Because I don't know what to do. So when I go to these open houses, I just say, it's just like the Christmas tree. Yeah. Yeah. Should I wear a suit and tie? Should I wear a t shirt? Should I be using my city? Should I look like a businessman? You're going as someone looking at an open house. You can do however you want. I would go very casually. Yeah. Yeah. Ladies, you have any? <laughs> flip. She just just wear some flip flops. That'll do. <laughs> yeah, just don't wear flip flops. flops. <laughs> don't wear flip flops. I like it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I wish people were such a good <laughs> Yeah. So, um, so as so, I'm well, not gonna, I, well, I know one thing. I'm not going to get to watch much Netflix. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. <laughs> no Netflix people, and don't watch any realtor movies either. <laughs> <laughs> They're all wrong. <laughs> and HGTV is wrong as well. Okay, so, but that's why your clients look at. All right. So with that, I think we're done. Unless anyone has any comments. Um, like wake up at the end of the course. Like what's up with that? <laughs> Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. You guys have a great weekend. And you have those of you did get my email. You have my email address. Feel free to email me with any questions. I am an agent as well, and I support the office here in Fredericksburg as their liaison with the broker. So. Um, I'm busy, but I will do my best to uh, get back to you. Yes, Barbara. Bye. Oh, bye. <laughs> bye, Barbara. Bye, bye. Bye. Thank you, guys. Appreciated bye. it. Thank you. Bye, bye. Have a great weekend. You too. You too. Bye, everybody. So now I can find my way back to the site. So you have like a patch, a patch, a couple of bosses, and IT people to work with you. <laughs> but okay. now I'm laughing at identification because when I really be in trouble, 
and I'm making sales or doing something and stuff is going wrong, all the people that you was with, be the people that be pushing buttons for me. Okay. <laughs> Can I get your business card? Yes. I don't get regular people. I get people just demanding that they get Stop the paper sure. right now, and if they don't get it now, let me grab some of it. Okay, I should always try to tell them in my pocket.